I hope that instructors will be able to take away from this lesson, from these, this little set of mock lessons, is how to engage our students with valuable lessons. So valuable, effective lessons. Our students vote with their feet. If they don't believe that what they're learning is valuable, if they're not engaged, then they're not gonna come to class. If they don't come to class, they aren't gonna get the material they need to get them to that next step in life. And so we are working on transforming lives and we can't transform lives that aren't there. So uh, the first step is to have our students engage in the lessons that are being taught and realizing that they are valuable. And how do we do that? That's through effective lesson planning. Welcome, uh, thank you all for coming. We're really excited about this opportunity to share with you. And today, hopefully my purpose for being up here is to really give you something to think about as you are in your training workshop. And I wanna connect with you some of the purpose on why we're doing this training. And it really is gonna center around some of our performance measures. And I got this definition from my, hopefully I get this right, I don't screw it up. The federal, Bureau of Education and Culture, I believe is where this definition comes from. Don't quote me on that, but you can absolutely look it up. Um, but it says, um, what, what are performance measures are generally defined as regular measurements of outcomes and results which generate reliable data on the effectiveness and efficiency of our programs, right? So for us, being a grant funded program, we do have performance uh, measures. And I wanted to talk about our accountability in two different ways. One is gonna be, what are, who are we accountable to for our grants or what are those performance measures that they're looking at us for? And then also our accountability to our college, our community college. So our performance measures for TWC. Each of you, as you come into our program, and learn more about our program, there is one area that educators are absolutely able to increase or transform or allow us to meet a specific outcome. You have that ability to do that in our measurable skills game. And so annually TWC comes out, they provide us with a target that we have to meet every year. And that is students who come into our program they come in and they test our baseline, which I think many of you are starting to get more familiar with. It's the CASAS assessment. They come into our program. It provides them a baseline once they complete it, and it's called an NRS score. And it's one through six. So our students, they come into our program, they take this CASAS assessment, and then after they take that CASAS assessment, they're in our courses, in our classrooms, and we're teaching them. And as we're teaching them, our students are learning and developing and gaining information. So then around 70 plus in-class hours, our students then take a post-test. And that post-test, our goal is to hopefully get them from that first NRS level, that one through six, let's say they scored in at a two. Our goal is to move them up to at least a, a three. That's our goal as an, as an educator in your, in your classroom. There's another MSG that you can get your students, and that's just the completion of the high school equivalency. So if your students complete the entire high school equivalency, that's considered an MSG as well. There are five different types of MSGs. The first one that I just named off, it's called an education and functioning level game. That's a pre and a post test. And then there's the high school equivalency completion. There are three others, and we're not gonna jump into those because they don't directly impact educators. So the only two that you can impact and help increase us with outcomes for this goal will be the pre and post test and, and or the high school equivalency. Let's talk about performance uh, measures for Amarillo College. So Amarillo College annually, they want our students at least 100 of our students to complete the GED. So that directly impacts 
your ability to help our students meet this measure at our institution. And then also we want to ensure that 200 of our high school equivalency students are also enrolling into Amarillo College. So those again are two things that you directly can impact based on your relationship and your guidance and coaching your students. So I wanna talk about performance evaluation, which is always the hard one because employee performance evaluation, it can be hard a little bit, right? But for the most part, that's not the one that you have to challenge yourself so much because either it's your employer gives you a set of data or skills or outcomes that they're, the expectations that they expect of you, and you will meet with your coordinator sometime within the next two weeks, and they will, she will share with you, Kathy will share with you, some of these outcomes that directly impact you, which are the ones we just talked about, but she's gonna get more granular and say, you're gonna be responsible for 10 GEDs, or you're gonna be responsible for ensuring that uh, 15 of your students enroll into Emerald College. So she's gonna talk to you about that a little bit more deeply. But let's talk about self-evaluation. Self-evaluation, on the other hand, is a little bit more difficult, right? Because I, you can say, um, a, a, a person who's been in education for 15, 20 years would have a hard time with saying, I have something to improve on. Normally, that's the go-to is, I've been in education for 25 years. I know what I'm doing, right? That's normally the go-to. But I would challenge each and every one of you as educators to always, always self-evaluate. I used to think that I had low self-esteem because I was always like, I can do that better. I can do something better. I can do something better. And I came to find out and I would get super irritated being around people who thought they were amazing. I'm like, I don't think, now don't get it wrong. If there are some things that I think I'm absolutely amazing at. But even in that, I look at myself and I say, I could have did, if I would have done this, it could have turned out like this. So I'm constantly in my head, always self-evaluating. And I found that it's not so low self-esteem. I just want to be better. I just want to know what can I do to be better. And so that is an area that I'm going to challenge each and every one of you as educators to do constantly is self-evaluate. Because think about it like this. I've had, and these are just interactions that I've had with other people or educators, when I say to them, so why do you think your students aren't passing the GED? The first go-to is, because they don't come to class. They don't show up in class. And I say, well, what do you think it is about students not coming to class? And they give me all these things. Their childcare, they say things like, um, they're not motivated. Seldom do I hear an instructor connected to themselves. Seldom do I ever hear that. Most times I hear instructors give me all the reasons why their students aren't coming to class versus is it something that they could be doing better in the classroom? And so I am going to challenge each and every one of you to self-evaluate yourselves. If you're having a classroom that has low retention continuously, I think that connects to some of the, the way that the classroom is being set up. It could be that the instructor is not as dynamic as they think they are. It could be that this instructor is not providing the information in uh, bite-sized, tangible ways for the student to actually understand it. So I am asking you to stretch yourself and to think about if you have this as a repeating theme, that every student, every classroom, every semester, that can't be a repeating theme. There has to be something else that you can connect that with. And Dr. Tamara Clunas says this all the time, students vote with their feet. The best advertisement that we can do for our program is to have a dynamic class. To, and now when I say dynamic, I'm not saying that you're like, oh, hey, I'm not that girl. I don't do that, that's not who I am. I'm saying making the classroom engaging, giving the students something and want to come back to get it again, because you're, you're transforming their minds, you're helping them to see things differently, but not that we're in here being instructors that are not being able to connect to our students. So again, I'm asking you to challenge yourselves. If you see yourself having students that are dropping off and falling off, you should reach out to them. We're gonna have one or two students every semester that we can't help, that will have some kind of barrier. I believe that, but if, 30, 40% of your class is not coming to class, I'm asking you to investigate. Dive a little bit deeper. See what's actually going on because I don't think that that's 
actually just a reflection of your students. I think that means you have to start thinking about, is there something different I can do in this classroom, this space, this setting for my students to want to come back to class, to learn, to be engaged? So again, I spend a lot of time on self-evaluation because I do feel like that's the one area that people have such a hard time with actually being accountable for. It's easy for someone to come and tell you what you're not doing, but normally nine times out of 10, you probably already know that, right? So instead of us, or our, cause you will start having an annual performance evaluation, Kathy will be giving those to you. But before that even happens, I ask you weekly, self-evaluate. Do I have students who are not coming to class? Do I have students who are not learning? Because at the end of the day, the goal is, it's just like if you created a final or a midterm. You want to see that your students can pass it. You want to know that your students can pass it. And if they haven't, you want to think about, well, what's going on? What's happening? And if they're not passing it, what's, you know, what can we do to increase that? We have a career, I'm sorry, we have a curriculum specialist who you all can let her, let her know. She's the type like me. She wants to know, what am I doing wrong? Let me know. She's not afraid of information like that. So let her know if you think there is a disconnect in the classroom with the curriculum to the students. She would love to hear that. Going back to the test, if our students aren't passing the GED, because that's the ultimate goal is to pass the GED and then matriculate into Amarillo College. We have to ask ourselves, why aren't our students learning? Why aren't our students actually passing the GED? So that's a challenge that I'm giving to everybody. And so as we are here today, we're gonna learn about five core competencies that Marty Cruz, our curriculum specialist, has is it delve deeply into to find out. <laughs> she has went into and found those five top things that are in our curriculum that allows our students to meet these performance measures, pass the GED, increase our uh, MSGs for our, our, our grand tour. So I want to introduce Marty Cruz Boothby. It's not by accident that Marty Cruz is our curriculum specialist based on her really life experience. She's been a home educator. Not only was she a home educator to teach her children, she's also been um, at Amarillo College and taught students how to pass or increase their grades on the TSI here at Amarillo College, and then been in the GED for many, many years. She is passionate about it. She really takes those tests to see where are those sticking points for our students. And she's created our curriculum around those very specific things so that we can see those outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, Madi Cruz, ha she is the curriculum specialist. She's available. And then currently right now, she's opened up her own new school for homeschooling. And so I think it's pretty cool what the things that she's doing. She may not come from education, but she has absolutely, in her field, in her line of work, become an, a master educator um, in my eyes. So, Madi Cruz, come on over. I'm going to ask Michelle never to say, I've been doing this a long, long, long time. I'm like, oh my goodness, a long, long time. No, I have. I've been doing this a long, long time. So, where am I going first? I think Michelle covered a lot of why we're here, what we're doing, um, but I'm gonna put up two things um, that... We have a quick question. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, you oh, said that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, we, the students will take the pre, but when is the soonest that they can take the post? I just, I miss for the MSG. Oh, so students can take the uh, post test for the MSGs after 70 hours of instruction. So once they have 70 direct hours of instruction, the students then we get ready to take the, the post uh, CASAS assessment. Who contacts them? So that's a great question. Um, so in order for our students to know that it's time to do it, our data team runs um, monthly reports. And whenever we, normally around the second eight weeks of instruction, I'm sorry, the 10th week. So they'll come in, they do their first eight weeks with their first instructor. Then that second term that they're here, around week two of the second term, they've accumulated around 70 hours. So then is where we start to reach out to the instructor and say, hey, these are the students that are ready to test. And the instructor actually registers them for their test. And we'll give some very detailed information on that in, via email. It's, and it's all actually on the uh, CRU hub as well. You can find it there. So Michelle talked about why we're here, 
Um, what's our purpose? And we saw data and we saw student growth, right? Um, so my piece, my job is to help you put together some effective lessons. So I say that and it's super humbling because um, even though I've been doing this a long time, like Michelle said, <laughs> some of y'all have been doing this a long time too. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just go through some, I think, some important pieces that should be a part of every lesson. And I don't care if you're digitally savvy, which I'm super not, or um, if you're just like me and you like paper and whiteboard. Um, either way, these your lesson should incorporate these two main things that we're going to talk about. And as I mock a lesson for you. I'm going to mock three lessons. We'll do two, two math and one language lesson. Well, I guess as time allows, we'll just see. Um, but that's the goal. As I mock those, we're going to keep these two things in mind at all times. So what are the two things for effective lessons? Michelle's talked about already in her, in her intro. They have to be engaging. They have to be engaging. So if they're not engaging, our students don't come back, right? Or they go, oh, oh, not, I don't, I'm bored. Um, we, they have so much, especially our students, they have so much fine for their attention. They've got kids, they've got spouses, they've got jobs, they've got life. Some have two jobs. They have life going on. They have problems. They have issues. Some come from um, just so many different backgrounds. So they need to be engaged because if not they're gone they're mentally gone at first and then eventually they go oh, why am i going right because they're not learning so engage yeah your les lessons have to be engaging we can talk about okay how do how do we engage then i think y'all all know this we they have to be engaging and then two let's see if y'all can figure this one out because i know y'all know engagement let's see if you can figure this one out what's maybe i hope this comes out right what's the <laughs> What's the question that most students ask when you show them a problem, when you teach them how to do decimals, fractions, whatever it is, when you teach them how to um, do pronouns and antecedents? Do y'all know what they usually ask? Or have I been doing this? Yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah, she got it. And guess what? Young people, old people, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They always say, when are we gonna use this? And our students in particular, their specific question is, is this going to be on the test, right? Is this going to be on the test? Yes, everything's on the test. And so, yes. So is this what they're really asking without knowing how to ask this? Is this valuable to me? Like, is this valuable? Because if you're just up there talking and it's not on the test, I don't care, right? And if I don't care, I'm not going to leave my kids, leave my house, leave my job, uh, take less hours at work, have less money, have pro money problems because this is not valuable. So it has to be engaging and it has to be valuable. And if I spell anything wrong, please feel free to correct me. <laughs> yeah, I, my, my hand and mouth move way faster uh, than, than I can keep up with. So engaging and valuable. So as I go through these lessons, I will try and show you how to make this engaging. And as for the value, your curriculum, so here's the nice part. Uh, your curriculum is set up so that it's valuable. Nothing in that curriculum for math or language has anything that you don't need. So as if any student asks you, is this gonna be on the test, you say, yes. <laughs> so either directly it's gonna be on the test or indirectly. Okay. Are they going to give you a fraction and reduce it? And that's one of the questions. Well, maybe not. But are you going to have to do a whole set of problems? And at the end, there's going to be a reduction of fractions? Yes. So either directly or indirectly, what we're learning is going to be on the test. This is not time for busy work. You're busy. We're busy. We don't need you to do busy work. We don't need you to just sit around and do some paperwork. We need you to learn. So. It's all valuable, that's the question. Now the engaging part, that's where, like Michelle said, it's all about self-evaluation. It's all about growth. You have to decide um, how you're gonna be engaging. And I'm gonna grab these markers. And I like that she said, you don't have to be like, ah, oh, you know, um, you don't. <clears throat> I'm really not, I'm really not that. Uh, so if I bore you, I hope I don't bore you. My, my goal is to show you how to be engaging, but 
I'm not the laughy, jokey, well, I am, but not so much when I'm teaching math or language, right? But I'm just not that. I'm not loud and vibrant. I just teach. It's just what I do. Um, my son is an instructor, and man, that guy can have the class just loud and talking and rolling, and he is a, a, a loud, uh, fun guy. I'm just not that. So we're all different. So do you have to have this grand personality? No. You just have to know how to engage people's brains, right? So let's start with that. You have a set of notes. They're guided notes. Let me get mine. You have a set of guided notes. So I have these CASAs results, these five competencies. We've seen these before. At our last professional development, we talked about what the competencies are. And so I will need to include that in your packet. I didn't, I didn't copy those. Um, but I'll just kind of read some off. If we're talking about math, our students are lacking in fractions. And then it kind of, I kind of broke it down, like interpreting fractions, recognizing when it needs multiplication, division. So fractions, expressions, equations, graphing points, representing and solving and graphing inequalities. And then you've got absolute value. So you've got five different competencies. Today, I'd like to look at two of those, fractions and expressions. And as we do these lessons, I mean, as we do these PDs further on, we will look at the other competencies. The goal is to have all five down. Why? Because these are the ones that we have seen our students are missing the mark on most, okay? After all the analyzing the data. And then the language where we're lacking here is purpose, main idea, getting them to know the difference between details and, I, and main idea, right? That's always the hard part. Um, analyzing and then um, interpreting your reading. So I can get you a breakdown of all of those. We'll have that actually probably at the break, I'll have them up on the screen so you can see them further or get you a copy of them. But we will work on one language skill. I say that. We're get, language is so intertwined. It's like spaghetti, right? It's, uh, um, it's, it's not like ice cubes. There's no compartmentalizing. Language is so like spaghetti. So we're going to do a language and I'll show you how I would teach a language. Now, I'm going to show you that and you may go, but I don't teach that way. And that's okay. So what I do could also be replicated um, digitally. You could, if you're a PowerPoint person, do a PowerPoint. You're a Prezi or a, um, what, what do you use, Diana? Jamboard. Jamboard. If you're a Jamboard person, whatever it is you use, we have board works, which, I mean, is great. It's already made for you too, right? There's all kinds of resources out there and you, you like the way you teach certain things and that's fine. So what I'm doing is just giving you, what if you had nothing? <laughs> if you were teaching, you know, in the dark ages, you have this board here. That would be chalkboard though, I think. So you got this whiteboard here and you have a marker and can you engage with that? Absolutely. Can you use the same, uh, same methods to engage in your, your, with your digital stuff? Absolutely. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. So I'll leave that on the screen. I'm going to show you a graph here later on uh, when I get to another part. So I'll start my mock lesson. The first thing you have is fractions. So why fractions? Is this going to be on the test? Your answer is? Yes. yes, it is. That's just always the answer. Yes, we're not lying to him. I don't lie, so we can't lie to them. It is really going to be on the test, directly or indirectly, right? So guided notes. This is just something I like to do. It's not something you have to do, especially with my first few days of class. Um, even at my school, I make them guided notes for the first couple of weeks. Why? Because people aren't born with the knowledge of how to take notes, okay? It's a skill. It's a skill. I don't know that I even learned it until mid-college. So, and I had to figure it out myself. So, guided notes. I give them this blank thing. This is how I know I'm going to teach the lesson so that they can follow along with the lesson, okay? They can follow along. They'll know what to put in and where. I write my lesson on the board just like they would follow in their notes. When you've been doing it this long, you usually do the same thing, say the same things, right? Uh, refine as you go. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to follow along. So 
Could you do this digitally? Yes. You could go on your jam board <laughs> instead of drawing these things out, instead of writing these things out, you, you know how to put that on there, right? So if that's your jam, that's what you're gonna do. Okay, so yeah, let's just, mm -hmm. yeah, there you go, drag and drop. See, if you'll teach me the drag and drop, then I might, I might use the whiteboard list, but I just love my whiteboard. Um, if I, I've, I've always said my dream classroom, and if I ever build, build for my own school one day, all my walls are gonna be complete white. There's gonna be completely whiteboard, maybe even the ceiling, I don't know, just all whiteboard. Okay, so let's get started. You are my students and hello y'all. We are learning about fractions today. So I'll ask, what do you know? What do y'all know about, about fractions? Anything, what do you know? You know something, maybe very little, maybe a whole lot, what do you know? <laughs> okay, on the bottom. Okay, so you said there's like like this, right? And there's something up here, yes, and there's something down here. Yeah, okay. What else? When you think of fractions, what else do you think? They're hard. They're hard. Okay, that's always the one of the things. So what am I doing here? I want to engage what engage, remember, I want to engage what do you already know? Our students already know something. So even my fifth graders, uh, they know something about fractions, okay? They've seen them. Oh, they're, they're like one half, right? But that's what you wanna do. So back here. So, okay, so you said there's a number on top and a number on bottom. See, you knew something about fractions and maybe they're hard. They're just different, not hard, just different. Okay, so what, what else do you know about these numbers? Anybody? Do y'all remember, did they have, do y'all know if they have names or? Parts of a whole. I like that because that's where that's the way I like to think of them. I like to think that they're parts of a whole. But what does that even mean? We're gonna visualize that in just a sec. Um, they have these this terminology, okay, math terminology, and it's this. Do y'all remember this? If I start writing that, it's numerator, and then the bottom is the denominator. Denominator. Okay. All right. Thank y'all for playing along. I think y'all are just playing, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Numerator, denominator, um, parts of a whole. All This is all saying the same thing. Okay. So if this is the whole, this is the whole pie pizza, I don't care, circle. That's the whole circle. Now, what the whole is telling me is how many parts I've cut it into, right? So super basic. We're just talking about fractions basics right now, okay? Because who cares if, I mean, if you can add them, subtract them, multiply and divide them, if you don't even understand them. So we need to understand them. So here's your whole, and you use, it tells us here that we're using, or eating, or whatever, three parts. Three parts of the four are shaded. Parts out of the whole. It's a fraction, okay? I'm gonna come over here and go, okay, what else can we know about fractions? They have this relationship, and th this is later on, but I always like to throw this in here because I think that if you see it this way, you don't think of fractions as super scary, plus it's gonna make some links for you. If I um, have, if I, I mean, I could eat not if, I can eat half a pizza, right? Half, half. I can have half of a dollar, not the whole dollar, only half a dollar. And I can own 50% of a business. Not the whole business, but half the business. All these things are saying the exact same thing. So where we're moving to, after we learn to add, subtract, multiply, divide these things, we're moving to, well, how does that relate to decimals? And then how does that relate to percents? And so why would I use this and not this? And when would I use this and not this, right? So we're going there. So I want you to keep that in mind. Percents and fractions are very similar. 
decimals too, but I think sometimes we, we shop. And so we say, oh, something's 25% off, right? And we, we need to be able to make connections. Oh, that's one fourth also. So if I don't like using that percent or turn it into a decimal, I can use a fraction. So they're all the same. So let's go back here. We got parts over a whole, I think you understand that part. And so on your first line, there, I'd put, you could put fraction, fractions or proper fractions. It's just, we're just talking normal fractions. And where you have that empty space is where you would take those notes. So here, when we're talking about, don't let this freak you out. I know, you give you people an X and Y and y'all start panicking. They mean something, okay? I could put hearts and stars. It just doesn't matter. The point is, I just want you to see that any fraction, this guy here is not just a fraction bar. He's also, what else? Do y'all know what else, what this bar can mean? A per, ratio. A per bar, ratio, divide. divide, right. It has lots of names. It's also a division bar. Okay, a division bar. There's a few ways to write division. You can write a sign, you could do division, a uh, division box, so a sign, a box, or a bar. This means division. That's connected to this stuff here, okay? So division, I just want you to keep that in mind. So this is like the most basic of the basic. What the names are, what does it mean? Here's a visual, and know that that's a division bar. So now you have two lines on your notes. One here, one here. So I'm gonna switch colors, okay? We're all different kinds of learners. I'm very visual. Um, I like to see things, I also say things, say the same things over and over and over so it sticks. Um, you, it's your job to figure out what kind of learner you are, okay? Does anybody know? Do y'all know what kind of learner you are? Have you ever? Kinesthetic. Okay, you gotta do, right? Okay. Auditory. Auditory, okay auditory okay let me do give it to me right do you know visual okay I'm very visual um, but you know I I do have to I have to write it myself and I think because I'm visual I need to see it in a certain way I need to see it in certain colors so it's good for you as a student to figure out how do I learn best now what you'll be tempted to do if you're a little lazy like me you'll go oh I'm I listen best, <laughs> but I'm going to challenge you to, maybe you think, well, I'm not really, I don't like to write and I don't learn best writing. I'm still going to challenge you to take notes because I promise you'll, we'll do this and you'll watch and you'll be like, oh yeah, I totally get that. But then you get home and you go, oh yeah, I don't remember what she said about that, right? So try this. Let's see. Okay. So on your next part of your notes, there's two lines. What are we gonna put on these lines? I'm not gonna tell you yet. We'll see how much you know, okay? So what about, I'm gonna do, what if we did this? What's wrong with it? Too many parts. It looks weird, right? Yeah. We're not used to this. You don't cook, you don't do like five-fourths cups of flour. You might go, what? What is five-fourths cups of flour? Do y'all know what the name for something weird like this is? is proper? Yeah. If this was a proper normal fraction, this is what we call good. You remember that. And you'll be surprised. Uh, students have a lot of terms floating around in their heads. Just make them pull it out. They really do. They'll start throwing things out and you're like, well, maybe that, but give me something else. So um, make them dig, make them dig back in there into their past um, improper fractions. So you don't have to put in fractions, but just improper, right? And yeah, it's improper, it's weird. The big one's on top. So visually, what does that look like then? How does that work? Because, well, there's three, less than three, it's less than four, right? So how would that look? Okay, we already said, this is how we break it down. Fourths, fourths, got it. But we need five. So here's one, two, three, four. This is what you're saying. There's not, there's too many parts, right? 
So yeah, let's get a new one. And now we can do the fifth. So now we, that's the visual. Five fourths, one, two, three, four, five fourths. Okay. But if you step back and kind of squint your eyes, well, how else could you say this? We could say five fourths, but how else could you name this? Well, that's a whole one, circle. one whole, one. one whole circle, one whole pie, one whole pizza, whatever. And this, how would you say this? One fourth, right? Look at this. This is what we call a mixed fraction, mixed number, totally. I mean, it just depends on how you learned and who taught you. Uh, so you could put mixed number, mixed fraction, okay? And we call it a mixed, here we are, one and one fourth. We call it a mix because uh, it's mixed but with a whole and a fraction. These two things are saying the same thing. So you go, why do, who cares? Is this gonna be on the test, <laughs> right? Always, always I like to address that. Is this gonna be on the test? Y the answer is yes. yes, it's always gonna be on the test. Mm -hmm. So yes, now are they gonna give you uh, improper and they say, okay, what's the mixed number equivalent? No. That's not going to be on the test. I wish. That'd be great. Everybody would, sorry, I forget I have this mic. Everybody would pass the test, right? So no, but are you going to need this skill? Absolutely. So if you're going to answer addition um, or multiplication or division, you're going to sometimes end up with this guy. But this is the answer, okay? This is the simplified version because you're not going to say, I need five-fourths cup of flour. No, your recipe is going to say, I need one and a fourth cup of flour. This is a simplified version. Okay, so you need this skill. Is it gonna be on the test? Yes. Okay, so there's that. Now, you get to do one. So this is another part of the engaging. And frankly, it's another part of the valuable because you, your students are gonna need to not just hear you talk, this is a terrible circle by the way, but they're not just gonna need to hear you talk, they're gonna need to do it. And I don't care if it's language, I don't care if it's math, but I think math lends itself more to, you need to practice, practice, right? But language is the same. They're gonna need to practice it. So I've modeled it, that's model, you do. I do, you do, I do, you do. That's the goal. I, I've been talking for, I don't know, who knows how long, but I need to be able to stop and give y'all a chance to take this in, okay? Um, here soon, uh, as y'all work this next one, I'm gonna show you a graph. Uh, I'm gonna, gonna piece out of this um, mock lesson. I'm gonna show you a graph about the, the science of forgetting and why it's important not just to talk the whole time or um, not to teach the whole time or lecture the whole time and not to do it all yourself. There's a need for them to practice and review and practice and review. So that's when you have to stop and I love to talk. <laughs> so I have to like purposely go, nope, I'm stopping here and they're gonna practice. Um, it's a skill, you gotta learn it. So let me give you one of your own and then I'll bring up that while y'all are working. Um, let's see. Draw it and give me the mixed number. Although I know some of you, we all come from different backgrounds and we have different levels of what we remember. You may be able to already see where I'm going with this, but if, I'd like for you to draw it just so you can see um, the visual, the reality of it, just in case you're a visual learner. Okay, so I'm gonna pull something up while y'all are doing that. What are your drawings? What what do your drawings look like? Somebody wanna be brave? I have uh, four circles. Okay. And they are all split in half. Okay. Why'd you do it in half? Because I have, uh, every hole needs to have two parts to it. Good, yes. The hole, this is what it's broken down into. This is what it's broken down into. So there's my hole, it's broken down, broken down. Okay. Um, Maybe if I just started with one, you know, I could keep going, but I think, I think we know we're gonna need more than one. Okay, then how many parts do we have? Are we gonna need to color in, shade in? Seven. Seven. 
Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that is what is our mixed number? I quickly thought it was three <laughs> holes, so three and one half. Three holes, one, two, three holes and one half. Okay, great. Now, we're gonna pause. I'm gonna show you this here. So, overcoming the curve. This is the curve of forgetting. There's a there's the science of forgetting, okay, or science of remembering. However, you want to think about that. And if you look at this, uh, there's a whole thing behind it. Actually, I just had to zoom it in. There's a really great uh, article about it. There's tons of articles and tons of curves. Everybody represents it differently. But this is how much your student has retained, right? At, during the class. Okay, they've retained this much as they're learning it. But look how quickly they're forgetting. So this is, this is how quickly they're forgetting the information. Yeah, within, yeah, 10 minutes of class ending. This is 24 minutes of class, one, I mean, 24 hours after class, one week after class, one month after class. So, so you forget very quickly, right? That's part of why your curriculum set up so that they have these fast facts every day and they have these skill drills every day for math, for language. They've got these read and responds, they've got these speech sentences. Um, it's not just so we can give them something to do and it's not just so that they can have a grade. Um, they really need to be hitting these things when they leave class that afternoon because look, in 10 minutes, look how much is forgotten. So how do we beat this curve? How do we overcome the curve? It's continual, it's repetition. And that's why your um, skill drills, your, they, they spiral, they spiral. So what they learned on day one, they're gonna need to learn. They need to see it again on day three. They need to see it on day five. They need to see it on day 10. Because by the time they get to the GED, this is one of the first few lessons. This is, could be long out of their mind. But since they're reviewing, constantly reviewing, reviewing. Okay, so what does it have to do with the, the lesson itself? The more you can get them to do that, to practice it immediately. I gave you the information. Your brain got it. Now you use it. Okay, got it, use it. So you, especially you kinesthetic learners, that's a big part of being kinesthetic. You need to actually do and see and, and touch and like, I need to do this myself. Why? So it goes further back in the memory bank. So that's why, part of why, part of why, because that's after class, but even in class, we want to make this valuable. Okay, we want to make this valuable. Plus it engages you. If I, I mean, it's easy to zone out, especially with some of our students. They're, um, they're if the younger ones come from a video game generation or, you know, social media generation and they, everything, uh, this whole TikTok thing. Okay. I'm old. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't understand it. I've never been on it. Um, my daughter, my son, they'll bring them to me sometimes and they show them to me, but it's, and I'm like, what is it? And they're like three minutes. Am I right? When I say three minutes of information. So they're, I'm, I'm amazed that they can, you know, hold attention for three. I mean, three minutes. That's all you get. Three. We're asking them to sit through class for an hour and 15 minutes and pay attention to math, to language, right? So we need to engage them. We need to make sure that they go, oh, wait, I'm gonna have to do something. They need to always be prepared that you're gonna ask them to do something, okay? So I asked y'all to do something. You got it. All right, fine. So can you draw these on the GED test when you get a fraction? Are you gonna be able to draw stuff? No, <laughs> it's timed, it's fast. So we need a mathematic way, mathematical way to get from here to here. That's the, that's the point. We can look visually and see how this all comes together. But at some point, you're just going to have to use a mathematical way to get from here to here. And then I'm going to tell you why. Okay, so let's first talk about how. How do you think, if I'm talking mathematically, how do you think I could get from here to here without all this? Do you remember what I said this bar could be? Divide. Division. That's a division bar. Okay. Yes, it's a fraction bar, but it's also division. 
So if we say 5 divided by 4, 5 divided by 4, 4 fits into 5 how many times? One whole time, right? Okay, one whole time. What's left over? We take that remainder, we throw it back over the 4. Same here. 2 fits into 7 how many times? Three whole times, and it would become a 6, right? Envision where that's going. Oh, the remainder's going to be a 1. The remainder's not always a 1. I just happen to come up with ones. Um, sometimes your remainder's a 2 or 3. And we throw it back over our, our denominator, right? Okay. So, on your notes, make a little line that says to get from here to here. You just divide. You throw your remainder back over your denominator. So why do you need to do that? Um, because sometimes you have these in your answer, as your answer, but you're going to have to answer it this way. Causes, uh, your causes test. So part of our digging into the data in order to get these performance gains um, on causes there, they go more basic than the, not super basic, but they do go more, a little more basic than the GED. So the, they will have um, just some simple fraction questions, especially on the lower levels. They'll have some simple fraction questions that they'll need to be able to do this, right? Um, they'll need to be able to simplify into that. But even on the GED, if you're going to answer a question, it's usually in this form, okay? So now there are times where you have to take this number and turn it back into this number, okay? So we could draw it out again. I could redraw this. I shouldn't have erased, well, no, that's fine. I could redraw this and we would go, okay, um, we could count them all up and then we could turn it back here. But again, you're not gonna be drawing things because we don't have time. Our, we don't have time on this test. This is a time test, it's super fast. So how would I do that mathematically? Did anybody remember? If I wanna take this and go here, any memory? It's a little harder, it's okay. I see it's working. You're multiplying something. Yes, something. So good. I love that. You're multiplying something. So one, you multiply these. One times four, because that's how many holes you have. One hole. And then you add the top. So multiply. One times four is four. Add the top is five. And we always keep that same denominator until we reduce and we'll get to that in a minute. So here we are. And that's what we started with. So... Your notes are your notes. What works for you? I like to think of this as multiply down, add up. Multiply down, add up. Some people say multiply to the side, add the top, whatever. So right here on my notes, I'm gonna put multiply down. Not sure why I remembered it that way, but that's the way it's stuck all these, all these years. Add up. I'm gonna give Michelle a hard time for that. From for a long time, a long time I've been teaching. No, it's funny because I was teaching. I was thinking that this morning driving here. I thought oh, I've been teaching for 16 years. Eight of those paid, <laughs> but 16 years. Um, yeah, that's craziness. Okay, so here we are. Now you know how to get from improper to a mix and a mix to improper. Why do you need to go from here to here? because sometimes you get these on your multiplication and division and you can't use those. When we get to multiplication and division day, you're gonna go, oh yeah, I already know how to do that. Everything we're doing today is basics. It's gonna help you in your addition, your subtraction, your multiplication, division. You can't do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division without these basics, okay? So you'll have this page of basics. You can look back, how do I make a mixed number and do an improper or an improper to a mixed? How do I do that? It's here. Okay, so now you're gonna do one. I'm gonna just, you're gonna go down in your notes so I don't have any room. And you're gonna make, uh, you're gonna give me this improper or this mixed. Okay. You don't wanna draw that. Nobody likes to draw thirds. They're like peace signs, really hard. What'd you get, Diana? 17 over three. 17 over three. Do you agree? Agree? I got agreement across the room? Okay. 
Good. So I do like to do that with my students. I One of them will give me an answer, and I won't say yes or no. I'll just say, does every, does, who, who agrees, who doesn't? And so I love that because someone will say, I don't agree. Instead of saying, I got it wrong, it's easier, especially for adults, to say, oh, I don't agree. And they go, okay. They, they think they might have it right. I haven't said it's right. It will get people who are wrong to talk a little bit more. You want to know, okay, so you got it wrong. What, what happened? What did you do? And then they'll talk through their process. So you always want to engage them. Talk, let them talk through their process. What did you do? Oh, you, you multiplied this way. Okay, I see what happened. Let's fix that. So we want them to feel free. To, we want to not just feel free. They should feel free. But we want to encourage them, like really push them. Why did you get it wrong? I want to know why you got it wrong. That's good. If you got it wrong, good. I like for one person to get it wrong because it helps me see the brain like, oh, what happened? Where'd your brain go? Why'd you think of it that way? So do that. Don't always automatically give them the answer. So y'all said the answer was 17. What did y'all say? 17. How about I do math? 17 over 3. I'm being lazy. So what did you do to get this answer? 3 times 5. Okay, 3 times 5 plus the two. All right. Three times five is 15 plus two is 17. And there you go. Good. Make them talk through. It's engaging. You're engaging them. They can't just be passive learners, right? They have to think because someone might call on them to explain their answer. And some of, I don't think they're using, cal I don't think they'd use a calculator uh, to figure this out, but you know, who knows? You want them to always be prepared to give an answer. Okay. Next part. You have two boxes at the bottom of your notes. What goes in those two boxes? I think I might have made them a little big, but that's okay. Down at the bottom of your notes of the page, you've got, I'm gonna just write them up here. I'm sorry if I may not be very camera friendly just because I don't really ever think of my placement and this, I'd like this in the center. Whiteboard should always be the center of everybody's lives. That's what I think. All right, so. What do I want in these boxes? There's a couple situations that trip students up. Like they just think, they just kind of weird out with them. Um, if I have a number, I don't know, five, that's the number. And I want to make it a fraction, right? If I want to make it a fraction, do y'all know what I do with that? Sometimes you have a whole number, you need to make it a fraction. What could I do with that? Because I could draw five holes, but that's not going to do us any good, right? So what I'm going to do is throw it over a one. And if we think about what we know, what's five divided by one? It's five. So these go together, right? So if you ever have a fraction, I mean a whole number, and you need it to be a fraction, just pop, pop it over a one. So any number, here's these lovely X's again, any number and you want to make it a fraction, or any whole number and you want to make it a fraction, just throw it over a one. This is a nice little piece of, if you need, if you're, again, if you're visual, you'll highlight it, you'll color it, whatever. Keep this in mind. On the flip side of that, if you any, ha if you have any number over itself, what is that? A yeah, it's a one. Because mathematically, five divided by five, right? Or you had five pieces of pizza and you ate five pieces of pizza. That's what I do, right? One, it's a one. You ate the whole thing, okay? Fine. Again, any number over itself is just a one. These two seem to be, in all my experience, the, some of the most mixed up, right? Some of the most mixed up uh, concepts. You can see, if you understand the math behind them, you can see how they work. So I have that kind of piece off to the bottom. All right, let's keep moving on. But before I do, any questions over what we've gone over so far? On any of the practice that we just did, Good? Y'all are fractions experts? Good? Okay, so I'm gonna erase this. We're on that back page and we are almost done with our basics. We, our fractions basics are almost complete. Once we do this, 
you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. You just need, you'll just need to learn some rules for adding and some rules for multiplication and rules for division. So it'll just be adding a few rules, but you have every basic skill that you need. Let's switch gears here. All right, so you have a line. You should have a line down the center of your, your um, notes. You also have this. Okay, you have two lines. We need to figure out what these are. Last two basic skills. So first two, improper to mix, mixed to improper. Last two, this. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's draw it out before we, we do it. Here's my hole, okay? And I like pizza. So this is all pepperoni, right? Okay. So this, what would we say? How much is pepperoni? We have how many parts out of the hole here? Four out of eight. Four out of eight. We would say, okay, well, four pieces out of my eight pieces are pepperoni. Fine. But if we look at it, would, it, would you say, hey, I got four out of eight pepperoni pizza? No. To your family? No. You're, what are you going to say? Half. You're going to say half. You're going to say half. You're not going to say, oh, I bought four eights, or I got four eights pepperoni. No, you're going to say half. So visually, we can see that. But again, we're not drawing on the GED. We need some mathematical skills to get here. If I can say anything about fractions, one of the most important things is right here. Because you can add and subtract and multiply and divide. But if you don't reduce right, if you don't reduce correctly, You've got it wrong. So reducing is the most important skill, I think, to fractions. There's a lot of skills, but you can learn all those and you don't know how to reduce well, then you're going to get it wrong. So how can we get from here to here? What do you see? What do you see? Let's see if you can, can get it. What do you see? How do you, how do, how would I get from an eight to a two? What are some ways? I could subtract, but like, right? If I subtracted six, I could get to two, but that doesn't make sense here. So it can't be subtraction. What else? How else could I get from an eight to a two? Divide, I can divide. What would I divide by? To, for eight divided by what could give me a two? Four, all right, four. Here's the rule of, uh, big rule of fractions. Whatever I do to the bottom, I do to the top. If I divided by four here, I'm gonna need to divide by four here. So four eighths is the same thing as saying one half because I divided by four on top and on bottom. Okay, that's reducing. We could also think about it as dividing down Dividing down, okay, yeah, we're getting smaller numbers. Same value, same amount, but the numbers are smaller. So dividing down, depending on what test you're taking, it could be simplify. Y'all know any other words that they would use if they want you to reduce? Simplify, reduce, dividing down, okay. Uh, lowest terms, I can, I can, I knew there was one more. Lowest terms. Put it in lowest terms. So all these words, depending on whether you're taking the classes or the TSI or the GED, these are what they're asking you to do. Put it in a simplified form, right? Reduce it. Okay, so I'll give you one that looks like this, and you'll do it. Reduce that. What'd you get? Uh, two over five. Two over five. What'd you divide by? Well, let me see. Did you get two over five? Yes. You agree? Yes. So what'd you divide by? Three because I saw like, the number they both have in common. Yes. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. I just skipped right over that, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> they have to. So 
let's just say, yes, you're right. I want to uh, clarify that. Divide by three, divide by three, you get two fifths. Can I go any further? I, I need to say that. Can I go any further? Can I divide any more? I can't, uh, can't I divide this by two and this by two? No, okay, so a two fits into here, but it doesn't fit in here evenly. So yeah, so that's the part I, I did, I just left right out my friends. Um, let's show you a non-example then, that might help. What if I say, well, I know a two fits into here, so I'm gonna divide this by two. Can I do this? No, by two. It would not. It wouldn't go evenly. So we can't divide that by two. And rookie mistake. Okay, rookie mistake. You're new to this, or you've seen this before, and you've forgotten. Sometimes students will go, "Oh, I'll divide this by two, and then I'll divide this by three. Okay, well that doesn't help <laughs> because the rule is it has to be the same number that fits into both of them evenly. Okay, that's what we call rookie mistake. You'll do it. You'll fix it. Same number each time, and that's where you got your two thirds. Okay, at this point, I'd probably give my students, I'd have set maybe five of them and say, okay, go from all different levels of difficulty, right? Where are they gonna fall short here? And this is covered a little before we get to fractions, but they're gonna need to know their multiplication division. So we, this is not the time necessarily to teach that, but you could, you could reinforce that by going, okay, let's talk factors. What all fits into six? Okay, we know that a one does. One times, times six, a two does. Two times what? Three, so all these are the factors. Factors, so if someone's really struggling, they're like, I know what I'm supposed to do, I just never know what number to pick, because they'll say that, I never know what number to pick. So then you would go, okay, let's factor this out. One, two, three, and six fit into here. Which of these numbers fit into here also? Oh, it's a three. Could I have chosen another number? We chose four, that's the best number to choose, but I could have said, I don't, I don't necessarily know my multiplication rule well, but I know that a two will fit into both of these. Most people start with twos if they don't, if they're, you'll see who's weak and strong in their multiplication. So you'll go, okay, two fourths, and that's why I would ask, can you go further? Because sometimes they'll reduce, but then you want to, they reduce and you want to go, but can I go further? Is there something else? Because sometimes there's something else. So there's that. Again, those are just, those are just minor details. Last thing on the fraction basics. This one, apart from adding and subtracting, it's going to be a little weird, but you're going to, I want to teach you the basic skill. So this one, I can relate to everything. Everything's gonna need to be reduced, everything. This one, you'll only use an addition subtraction, and it's a little odd without adding and subtracting, but we're gonna do it anyway. So let me give you the visual. Again, with the pizza. So it's just me and my husband, because my kids, well, they were all almost grown. We, <laughs> we got, I got my half, bacon, he's got his half, pepperoni, okay? So here's my half, the most important half, it's the bacon. Okay, and then my adult son calls and he says, hey mom, we're coming over, and, um, and his wife, and I was like, okay. They're like, do you have any extra pizza? I'm like, yeah, fine. So what do I have to do right now? How much do I have bacon? Half, half, half. Okay, they come over, they say, but we're coming over to eat. <sighs> so I have to cut it some more. Now how much bacon do I have? I still do have half, but how else could we say it? Two fourths? Two fourths? Yeah, I have two out of four. Okay, and then my my 17-year-old daughter comes. She's like, wait, I'm gonna be home early. I want pizza too. So I have to cut it again. Now how much do I have? Four over eight. Uh-huh, four over eight. So if this was reducing and dividing down, this one, anybody maybe know what I might name this? Starts with R too. I don't know, we all call these things different, something different, I think. I would call this raising or multiplying up. I need some I's in there. Multiplying up, right? Dividing down, multiplying up. Because to get from here to here, just like we saw here to here was division, here 
to here, we would multiply by two times two. And the rule is whatever you do to the bottom, you do to the top. Okay, then it's two fourths. And then we could keep going on infinity, right? We can cut this sucker up pretty small. Who cares why? This piece, we're not gonna work through it because we don't know all the rules for addition yet. But there will come a time when you have something like this, two thirds plus one fourth. And you'll learn a rule that says, <laughs> I see the face, no, this is it. This is why I said it was hard. Uh, so I see it. All right, I love that. Um, that's exactly like our students. Oh yeah, you have to have the same bottom and they'll remember, they'll start remembering like the flood trauma of math, eighth grade math comes in, right? There's like, it's like all this trauma. Um, okay, so there will come a point where you'll see this and you'll learn the rules and you'll have to go, oh, I need the common denominator. I think some of you already said that and you saw it, I could see it in your eyes, the terror. Well, guess what? You already have the skill. That's what's gonna be cool. So, what number, because this was like multiplying by whatever. So I can't just pick a number. I have to say, what number would these both fit into, right? We're going to get to that when we add and subtract, add, add, sorry, adding and subtracting. We're going to have to pick a number. Right now, I'm going to tell you because we're, we're, we're not there yet. But right now, I know that both of these, unless somebody knows, y'all know things. What would both of these fit into? 12, yeah, if I count by threes, three, six, nine, 12, 15, okay, and then I count by fours, four, eight, 12, ah, here are the 12. So both fit into 12. Okay, so here's the piece. If both, you'll have to know how to do this. You, finding the numbers, one part, but then how do I get these tops to change without changing these values? You've already done it. This times what gives me 12? Times four. And our rule is? All right, whatever you do at the bottom, you do the top. We've already discussed that. So two times four is? Eight. I know, tricky. So now we have a new fraction, great, we can use it. And then on this one, four times what gives me 12? Three. And then if we do it to the bottom, we gotta do it to the top. Auditory learners, if you have, um, you will, you'll have auditory, you'll have a mixture. The more you can say things over and over and over. I always tell my students, I'm like, when you're in a test, I want you to hear my really annoying voice going, whatever you do to the bottom, do to the top. Whatever, you know, like the same things over and over and over. Because they might be auditory learners. They might be visual learners, okay? Kinesthetic learners, they need to do it, okay? So, so that's where this is gonna come in handy is when you have to start changing fractions. We're not gonna work all this out because we don't know all the rules yet, but that's where this comes in play. You now have all the basics. Let me give you one. If I, to work, if I do, I like eights today. I'm not sure, okay, and, and three. So let's go with, um, Yeah, why not? Okay. What's this? I know, I put an X in there. <laughs> you do good. So see, it's not scary. It's not. You just needed the skills to get up there. So what? what is this? What is X? 18. How'd you get that? So if you use the bottom number as reference, you see I got the 21, so you yeah. never multiply by two. Right. How did I get here? I multiplied oh, by two. How did, I'm sorry, by three. How did I get here? I multiplied by three. And we are using that same rule. Whatever I do at the bottom, I do the top. And there we are. 18. Yeah. Okay. If we drew that out, it'd work out. So those are our basics. Let's review. We learned improper to mixed, mix back to improper. We learned uh, reducing, dividing down. We learned raising, multiplying up. All of these skills you'll need for adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. Now, when you go into those things, 
you're not you're going to be practicing these as you go through your skill drills through your um they may be on your fast facts later but not yet but for sure in your skill drills you're going to have you're going to have to keep producing and raising and multiplying i mean and doing improper to mix mix and improper so that as you go through adding subtracting multiplying dividing these skills are settled we're just going to add some rules how do we add how do we subtract how do we multiply these are the fraction basics questions okay what is an improper fraction last bit and we're closing this this lesson down What's an improper fraction? How would you say it in your own words? Okay, you have holes with some fraction left over. Okay, that's one way. How, that's, that's okay, that's a good way. You're visual, it's a visual, yeah? So you have uh, an improper fraction, you, your uh, numerator is larger than your denominator. Yes, and it's improper, that top number's weird, right? That numerator, good use of the terminology. Okay, what'd you say? A number greater than one. Yeah, yeah. Number, oh, yeah. yeah, it has to be greater than one, yes. Because zero wouldn't count. We're not even going with the zero right now, but yes. All right, so good. Uh, that was a quick quiz. Any questions? All right. So I, when Madi Cruz did this lesson for uh, me not too long ago, one of the things I've been teaching fractions, and I never taught the basics first. I kind of just went into, you know, doing improper to, um, uh, to proper fractions and then teaching them how to do... Uh, adding in, subtracting fractions. I never went over all the basics first. And I thought this was really transformational for me as an educator, because I'm, I'm not an educator, I, I'm a scientist. So I didn't really put all of this together. And when I saw the way she did it, I was kind of blown away um, at seeing it done this way, because most people I know don't teach it this way. Most people I know go in and teach fractions um, in compartmentalized ways. So you learn about the denominator and the numerator, then you transition into adding like, um, adding fractions with like common denominators, then adding fractions with unlike common denominators. And then you start talking about the raising and reducing because you're getting ready to transition into multiplying and dividing, but never going over the fraction, uh, basic fractions. So I kind of want to get on camera what your thoughts about this? Because you're going to have educators who come in. This is very different um, for, for some people. And I say that based on my experiences and the people who have taught me um, before I started teaching. I kind of want to know, and I don't think Monty Cruz will be offended. I just want to kind of get that out here so folks who are going to be having this training and watching it, I want to see what you guys can say to what you have been experiencing in the classroom based on the way that the curriculum is set up. So do I have any takers? So teaching the basics of things like, such as fractions, you know, such as raising, reducing, mixed number, uh, to improper and proper to mix, I feel like it gives a lot of value. Although I think it would be best if we can kind of throw it in where it's relevant, because um, based on how the things are set up, we kind of go about it teaching the very basics first um, and then try to tie it in once we get into the meat and potatoes like adding, subtracting, multiplying. But if we can incorporate it this way, um, I think it there would be more success and more understanding. Oh, I understand now more where raising comes in or reducing or how to change it to uh, a mixed uh, to an improper when that's appropriate or vice versa back from an improper to a mixed number. Um, just where the relevance is rather than maybe having a whole lesson or day spent just covering the basics where they probably can't see the big picture. Um, and I see that sometimes being the confusing part where they just can't see the big picture overall. And so just real quick, one of you, um, we addressed some of the two of the things that um, Marty Cruz started off with was effective um, lessons. So one of them is engaging, um, you know, having the students do a thing, how do they uh, connect with the information and then the value. So really connecting it to the why. So she talked about that. So that's where each of you as instructors would come in and put put your spin on why why do we do fractions? What is it that you do maybe in your everyday life? How do you connect that, make that relevant to them? And so she kind of talked about some of that um, during the beginning, but that's great. That's effective, valuable teaching, exactly what you're saying. Do I have any other takers on how you feel about maybe um, some of you more seasoned, not, or more, you know, have had more experience in the teaching. Not saying that you have not, Milton, but you know what I'm saying. Um, some of you. 
A lot. <laughs> Um, well, I thought at the beginning that you started with uh, uh, background knowledge, so you're asking the student, what do you know? Um, a lot of students will probably not have background knowledge, but it's okay because as you're giving the basics, how you hit everything, when we, you do the lesson where you are going to add uh, fractions, everybody that was there that day will have the opportunity to share their background knowledge. So maybe you didn't do it on purpose, but I think you did. Um, this is, you embedded a first practice, so when you're teaching the actual lesson, it'll also be part of re review, so you're compounding that. And I, I really like that. And I saw, uh, I'm one of those students that zone out as when someone is lecturing, but you made it a point to stop as you're teaching to ask the student, um, what do you think this is? And for those that are zoning out, that would just wake me up and it's like, okay, I'm in class. I like that too. And it's hard to do it when, when you really know your content because you're over there and, and you're performing and you're in the flow, but then you see like, oh, I'm losing them. And I like that um, you just do it naturally because that's how long you've been teaching. <laughs> um, and for me, um, and it's something that I struggle with at the beginning, the different ways that people learn. And so you, and I noted this first, uh, when you started, you gave an actual example of a fraction, so three over four. And then you, you, you use the same setup to introduce the terminology, uh, which is um, numerator, denominator, but you also went and you paraphrase that terminology with um, whole and parts of a whole. And then you also help the visual by, uh, by drawing it out. So in one shot, you took care of every single uh, learning style, and you're also uh, taking care of the people that have to talk and have to engage with your stopping. So I really like that. It's hard to do. You have to be really comfortable with your content to be able to pull that off at the teacher. And another thing that I liked is what you just did. Uh, sometimes when we get to the very end, we rush off. But you uh, you restated the objective at, that you uh, meant to teach at the very end. And you didn't let, you didn't leave anybody off the hook where we're relaxing because this is, has now ended. You, you, you threw in a curveball with the last question. And so you did the I do. Uh, we do because we practice, and the you do as we're leaving with the curveball, and we're, all, we're also going to have homework. So I just think this was so nicely, nicely done. So thank you. Wow, thank you. I appreciate that. You you sound like me the day she taught. I was like, girl, you're going to change the game. I, I'm going to teach fractions so much differently. So, Angela, I would really like to hear your input because I know that you've been teaching for a long, for a while. Um, give us your input on your uh, thoughts on how starting with the fraction basics versus giving them all this information at one time with, again, compartmentalizing fractions, but really starting with the fraction basics. And it can be, I mean, I want you to share your honest opinion because I know that you have been teaching for some time in your experience, so we'd like to get that on camera. Absolutely, like you said, we oftentimes we think that they already should know what that is, but sometimes people don't even know what a fraction is, and you're starting to teach them how to do, you know, adding, subtracting, stuff like that. They don't even know what the fraction is, so I think that is a good idea uh, that we start out with what is the fraction and the where you describe the whole and the parts and all of those different things like that. So, and then, you know, I always like to ask my students what they know about it, but a lot of times they don't want to tell you because they're afraid that they don't know or they don't think they know anything. So if you kind of, like, she kind of guided us a little bit to pull a little bit of that out and started at the very base. Oh, yeah, I know what that is, and especially pizza. I use pizza a lot, too. Sometimes I say pie, but pizza is a big thing, too. So, um and then, you know, going through there and wrapping it up. And then and then actually putting the terminology. I always like to make sure that they know the actual terminology because on the test, they're not going to say a part. They're not going to say uh, a thing over another thing. You know, they're always going to say a fraction. They're going to call it a denominator. And if you don't know what those actual words are, then you're going to have a hard time, you know, understanding what – because they write out so much on that test – and then I also, you know, like to make sure that after we've done that, that they know how to use it on the calculator, too. So because they are going to get to use that calculator. So we always do, you know, start out with that. But I do like the fact that make sure that we start at the very basics and, you know, make sure they even understand what a fraction is. 
So that may be a little bit more helpful. And I do appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you all so much. Um, I do. Michelle said it earlier. I do. I do like feedback, and I don't. I. I actually. She. She thinks I'm crazy, but I don't like positive feedback. If that makes any sense, I always want to hear like, what can I change? What can I do? What can I do differently? What might could we tweak? Uh, so I. I just have this. Um, this. I always want to grow, and I get so. If you ever see something, you're like, wait, you know, I really think if we did this in the curriculum. Okay, I write it, but that doesn't mean you can't give me pieces and you can't go, well, you know what, what if we put this here? So like Milton, you know, if you say, well, what if while we're teaching this, this is also in there? So they're practicing it this way, right? Um, for sure that. What else? So we were engaging. This is the, the two main things we need to make sure. Are we engaging them? Pulling an eye, like I said, pull, we're not we have to really pull it out of them. We have to make them comfortable to say things, right? And to be wrong even. Oh no, you said something, maybe you said something wrong and you go, uh, your student said something wrong. And you go, well, that, that, is some, that does relate to something else. You're remembering something, but right? So we, we need to let them be okay with being wrong. Um, they need to do that. And then is it valuable? So constantly engaging them, pulling them back in, making it valuable to them. Um, I, as I was sitting there, you said something, Angela, that, that caused me to think and then I got it from my chair and then I forgot. So, uh, <laughs> so um, I had to do with the end. I don't know. Oh yeah, that's it. So I did this all old school whiteboard, right? But you, you, you need to think, how could I teach that this type stuff in the way that I, I teach, like in the format, my own format. So you said Jamboard, right? I can talk. Huh? Can I talk yeah. Something? Yeah, I please. What my, what is <laughs> Do I? Pizza's, relevant. Pizza's <laughs> always relevant, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of relevant, especially when we, it, when you go through. So what, as we move forward to adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, because again, is this going to, let's see how well you listened. Is this going to be on the test? Yes. yes. Are they going to ask you just to reduce something? No. But is this going to be on the test? Yes. Because adding, so they're going to ask you to add or subtract or multiply, divide, right? So in the end, this is on the test, right? I love it. Y'all are learning. So um, you're going to need to get some, re well, you have your skill drills. You can always work off of that. Um, if you have your own favorite resources that you like um, to make, relevant word problems. So I did bring some of my favorites. Um, so when I'm putting together a lesson, I'll use something for the GD, I'll use something like this. Um, this is pretty general, but so I'll get it, I'll get my word problems for here. You can make them up yourself. I do that sometimes right on the spot. You can make them up, but these are, these are relevant. The GD is re relevant, right? Um, the high set, we don't teach that. I mean, we don't um, have that test here, but also relevant. So the equivalent GD, high school equivalency tests are relevant to life. They're not going to just ask them to add a fraction. They're going to put it in um, a word problem, right? Real life. They're not going to ask them to multiply um, a fraction. So then there's there's this too. I love these books. Um, I'd be happy to share. Y'all can take a picture. They're just my go-tos, so I don't have to come up with everything. And then going back to, you said Jamboard, right? That's your thing. So could you still teach this, covering these things with your Jamboard? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, whatever your teaching style is, maybe you are digital. Um, maybe you're not. And this is, you don't need much. You don't need a whole lot to be engaging. You just have to pull them in, make it, make it relevant, right? Give them value. And that will help them keep coming back, even beyond the barriers. So if a barrier is, I don't have a car. If a barrier is, it's hard for me to find a sitter. If whatever the barrier is, they will work harder at overcoming that barrier. Am I saying they're always gonna overcome the barrier? No, if we can help, we wanna do that, right? We wanna, we wanna direct them to the right place to get the help. But if it's this, they're gonna go, you know what? I can call my sister, she can give me a ride. I can call my mom to come watch the kids, whatever. They will find a way to overcome that barrier for an hour and 15 minutes if they feel like 
I'm getting something here. I'm engaged. Like, I want to know this. Oh my gosh, I have, now I have background knowledge that I didn't have before. I know something, right? I know something. So if it's these two things, they'll overcome that barrier. And then your classes won't lose. Am I saying you won't lose any? There's always those who you're going to lose. But, and that will help our retention. So that's kind of back around to the overarching goal is to help us get those performance numbers, right? The, the data performance to raise those numbers. How do we do that? We keep them in the class. How do we do that? Engaging, valuable. That's how we get them to pass. That's how we get them to stay. And that's how we get them into college. And so one last thing, um, we are gonna do another lesson, but I know y'all need a break. I could talk all day long. I could stand up here all day long in these hills. I'd be perfectly fine but y'all need a break. But before I do that, how do I want to tie this to college? Because we need to remember, it's not always, we all have been trained. It's not just about the GED, okay? It's not just about high school equivalency. We want them into college. So why do I do this? Because you know what? We could, I know we could. I could have spent however much time I've spent teaching some tips and tricks to get them to pass that GED. Here's a GED question and let's, let's dissect it. We could do that but that's not gonna help them when they're in the college classroom. They need, they need depth, they need, they need a foundation. We're trying to do so much in, in eight lovely weeks. We're trying to build foundation. We're trying to give them some prior knowledge so that when they go into college, they, they don't just fail, okay? And we want them to pass the GED, so we have a lot to do. We have a huge foundation to fill, lots of gaps to fill in. They've seen this somewhere in their past, but we got some gaps to fill in and get them ready for college and pass their GED test. If we could just do one, we might make things a little simpler, but we have them all to do. So be prepared to work. Don't, Don't wear heels. heels. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Michelle. And I'm going to just highlight this because I think initially when I started off, I talked very specifically about performance measures and accountability. But I think if we talk about or, or connect it to our why as educators, that that might be more transformational to us. I mean, I'm all about the data and I'm, because I'm the director of the program, I'm, I have all these other responsibilities. So I'm thinking of accountability, performance measures. But I think for us as educators in the classroom, our overarching goal really is to transform our students' lives. And how do we do that is through education. So really maybe if it's more of the matriculation into college that really the end point, the end goal is to actually help our students um, become formally educated, which would be our college education, either a level one, level two, or, or an AAS degree, with the goal of helping them get into a career that can allow them to uh, uh, earn a middle skill wage for their families, right? So that's really the ultimate goal for us as educators. We understand fully that if we didn't have our degrees, we wouldn't have the positions that we have. So we fully understand that um, connection to education and that that should be our primary goal. Because if that's our primary goal, all that other stuff I talked about, MSGs, completion of the GED, that means we did that, right? That means we covered all of that if our students are actually enrolled into the institution. So I would say for us as educators, if we keep at the forefront, the ultimate goal is to help our students refine them, transform their lives through education. And that's actually completing level one, level two certification and then finding an actual career in their field. All right, so welcome back, part two. So uh, we, we did go a little long on part one. I'm gonna modify what part two will look like. This is no disrespect to my language teachers um, at all. So please feel equally valued. I, I, I was gonna equally give you as much time. So, but what I'm gonna do, because Michelle's asked me uh, to hit another um, very important math skill, one that we're lacking, again, in CASAs and GED, and that has to do with expressions. But um, before I do that, I really, I do wanna give some attention to language, how to teach language. That may be, again, what do I know? Um, but how, how would I present this material? How would I engage a student with reading? Because I don't know, but if you, I don't know if, if, if you do this, but when I asked my language students, like, how many of you read? 
so I, I said this this year, I was like, I read 20 books this year. And one student was like, I haven't read 20 books in my whole life. And I was like, oh no, you gotta read. So they don't love to read in general, right? Um, <laughs> So we have to get them to read. We talked earlier, just before the sessions uh, started, about um, how we can't go back to teaching them how to read. We have eight weeks. <laughs> That's how, well, you know, sometimes they come back and they do it a couple of times. But really, in our, in, our, in our program, we have eight weeks. So we can't go back to, one, phonetics. We're not going to go back. Most of our students know how to read, but the comprehension skills are, are lacking. And so our math, math instructors, you don't wanna um, tune out because guess what? They're reading a lot of math uh, word problems, like some ma like whole pages of stuff. So, so we want to also pay attention to that here, but we wanna look at the reading. The plan was to do a full day of language, as you see on your, um, you would see on your schedule of instruction. So on one day, I believe it was day four, um, you would have, it's broken into grammar and then it's broken in, and then reading. So part of the day, um, that hour and 15 minutes you would spend teaching, I think that day's grammar was pronoun antecedents, right? So you would do pronoun antecedents that day, um, how to compare the two, how to make sure that they match in, in number and gender, and then so I was going to do that. We're going to skip that part, the grammar part of it. Not because it's not important, but because if we're focusing on, well, we have a time issue, but we're focusing on the main things we're missing are five competencies that we need to raise for a language. The biggest is reading. So if I can, for any new instructors, um, any instructors who've been doing this a long time, if I can um, impress anything on you, if you're a language instructor, it's this, the GED itself is mostly reading. So grammar is important. There's like, I don't know, a portion of the test of it, 10 questions, eight questions, and those are easy fixes. I think of grammar like math, there's formulas, there's a way to fix grammar, right? Okay, those are easy fixes. The reading is a little, a little harder. So we wanna be able to create effective readers. We wanna model effective reading because most of that test is reading. Same with the TSI, it's a lot of reading. What I do, if I have to compare the two and CASAs, um, their readings are a little bit easier to digest. They're a little small, a little shorter, um, smaller in length, and then they aren't as intense as the GED. Plus the questions, I think I talked to language instructors, the questions on the GED are a little crazy. <laughs> um, not how I would answer, ask a question, but that's okay. We're still gonna help our students. The main thing we're gonna help our students is engage in the reading, right? We want them to engage, because I promise they'll wanna zone out, especially if your class is the more, first morning class and they're like, you're gonna make me read this. It's really early. We want them to be engaged in the reading. We want it to be valuable. I pulled a reading off of a midterm. I went through, couldn't decide, and we have three pathways, the healthcare, the industrial, and the business. And I was like, I don't wanna choose one over the other. So I went kind of middle of the road and went on the midterm, which is pretty general. So we have one here, this comes off the midterm. I'm gonna use it as if it's a practice reading. So in class for language instructors, you have a practice reading um, so you can help teach that reading skill, model that skill, have them practice the skill. And then they ha go home, like on the flip side, they'll go home and do a read and respond. Where in math, y'all are used to skill drills. Well, in language, it's a read and respond. This is an on your own um, trial of how to do this. They're going to take that home, try to recreate it. So let's start with reading. So here's Here's the mock lesson for the reading part of the language. So we're gonna pretend I taught you all about pronouns and antecedents and how to put them together. It is one of my favorite things to teach. And now we're to the reading. Okay, so everybody, I printed out a reading for you. I'm sorry, it's really blurry. I'm not sure why um, the printer was nuts. So I want you to take a moment to read this. I'm not gonna tell you how, I'm not gonna, but I just want you to take it in, read it, 
and then we'll discuss it. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes and I'll model the reading speed. So if you want to look it on your paper, you want to look it on screen, you can do that. But go ahead and read that for me. Has everybody read done reading? Okay, so you should, you should be done right about now. Um, I, I know that some of us read slower, we're not used to it, and that's okay. Okay, so this is about the reading speed that you should be at, especially when we're uh, taking this GED test, it's timed. So how do you get to be a better reader? Any answers? You just, you just read. I don't have, there really isn't like this tip or trick, sadly. You just have to read. I don't care what you read. So I, I will say right now, I'm in the I'm middle of a, mag. it's a magazine. It's like a real in hold in your hand magazine. Uh, it's Life did a, 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 a whole piece about peanuts, the comic strip. Oh my goodness. It's like one of the, I got one of, um, of the Wizard of Oz one time and oh my goodness, it was amazing. So it does all these like backstories and really cool stuff. Anyway, I say that to say, I don't care what you read, just read, <laughs> read. Don't just like skip through all the Yahoo news and hit the headlines, actually read them, read them. So the only way you're gonna be a faster reader is to read, right? The only way you're gonna be a better reader is to read, you're gonna get the vocab down. So that's my soapbox, read folks. Um, read and read to your children. If you have children, read to them, read to your pets. They like to hear your voice, right? Um, so what, I'm not even gonna tell you what we're learning today. I know you have it on your schedule of instruction because y'all are paying attention to that. But let's just talk about what we read, okay? Let's, let's forget the lesson for a moment and just talk. What did you read? What was this about? It's about the effects of complaining on your body. Okay, the effects of complaining on your body. So I'm just gonna put that up here. Effects. So I'll just say physical effects of complaining. Yeah. Okay. And then complaining. Anybody else? Refine. Y'all want change that? Refine that? Add to that? Take away from that? What? Complaining isn't good for us. Okay. Complaining isn't good for you. Say okay. Isn't good. That's another way of saying that. That's good. Isn't good for us. Okay. Anybody else? All right. I would say yeah. I I think the those two sentences kind of. Tell us what this is about. If I if I said, "Hey, Kathy, what are you reading about?" and you'll you would say, "Oh, how complaining is bad on your body." What are you reading about, Diana? Oh, it's about how complaining is not good for you, right? Okay, then I would I would know what you're reading about. I don't know all the specifics. I don't know all the details. Then I might like, say, "How? How? What happens?" Right? Because I complain a lot, so I need to know <laughs> how this is going to affect me later on. I'm a complainer. Um, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm a recovering complainer. Actually, I'm a little better. Um, what, what would I call these two sentences? What's another? Yeah, y'all, y'all heard this before. Y'all been in language classes. What would I call this? Anybody? It starts with an M. Main idea. This is the main idea in our own words, right? Um, it's the point. It's it is. What's the point, right? The main idea. What's the point? Um, so main idea. That's what we want to talk about. Main idea. If I would have said, hey, because this happens when you ask like a a youngin who's just learning to read, I know, believe me, I know. You ask him, you say, hey, what are you reading? And then they give you like all these details and you're like, I just want to know what's it about. Like you say, hey, what's that book about? And then they give you all these details. And you're like, I just want to know what's about. Okay. So if I would have said, hey, what are you reading about? And you're like, um, like that it does. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what are we talking about here? Complaining gives hippocamp, you know, does damage to your hippocampus and it gives you cortisol, uh, raises in cortisol, which could be, okay, those are details. So we have to be able to piece apart main idea. What are you reading from a tiny detail? I, I like to think of main idea as like this umbrella, right? 
oh, my students love my drawings because I'm telling you I'm an artist. So I like to think of main idea as an umbrella, right? If this is the main idea, then all the details should be able to fit under it. And it doesn't always work out perfectly because no writer, no writing so subjective, no one writer, sometimes they have like a couple main ideas they're trying to share, right? So main idea would be like, okay, this is what it's about. Let's say we'll use that physical effects of complaining. That's our main idea. That's our umbrella. Okay. And then if you see a detail, um, maybe it's in a question they ask, maybe a detail about the damage to the hippocampus, right? Okay, hippocampus, I'm not going to write that all out. Damage, and then they talk about raising cortisol. This is that hormone, stress hormone, uh, all about uh, raising cortisol. Um, so all these, do they fit under this physical effects? Yeah. So if we think of our main idea as our umbrella, then the details should fit under. But what if Milton, because he's just a math guy, he doesn't know language. Mil Milton said that our main idea then, and, and by the way, I do pick on my students. I do. I like, I'm sarcastic with them, and I like to pick at them, and, and they know that's because I love them. So um, if you can develop that with your students, do that. They're not as afraid as you think, uh, and they're not as... They, they like to have fun. So um, main idea. Maybe Milton, what's a bad main idea? Give me one, Milton. Yeah, like what, what would a, or if you who have taught students, what would a student possibly come out of thinking? Of? If they didn't read carefully, they'd probably say complaining is like a drug. Okay, that's a good one. I love that. So I'm going to switch that. Okay, here's a bad main idea. But a student, I say bad, not in a judgment way, but... They're picking a detail, right? They didn't. They they just kind of skimmed. They remembered drug, and okay. So complaining is like a drug. Oh, this is in there. Could I go find that in there? Yeah, I could find that in there. But does damage to the hippocampus, raising cortisol? Uh, what's a, I mean, there was lots of other. Do all does everything fit under? It's like a drug. No, because what about the part where it talks about it's not just you and the part where you're spending time with people, um, do I do something? spending time with people, how that can affect you, the, the people who are. So does that have anything to do with complaining is like a drug? No, that doesn't really fit. So if you can't take this main idea and make an umbrella out of it with most things, most things in there fitting under it, it's not the main idea. So that's the way I like to think of it. I know that coming out of lesson mode, I know that, that as instructors, you have your own ideas of how main, what main idea means to you. That, this is where you would put that in. Here's how I would teach main idea. I, I give them the exact example because I'm not a language teacher and I'm not a math teacher um, because I'm ne neither trained in either one of those. I don't, I don't use a lot of the right, same terminology or exact terminology. So if you're a, if you are a language teacher, this is where you would go, okay, main idea is this and you know how you teach. And this is where I would put that piece in. But I would not skip to the lesson of teaching main idea until we at least talked about this a little bit. Like, hey, what, what is it? You know, you give them the chance. Many students are like, give me the objective. Like, what are we learning today? And, and they're like, um, what is this gonna have to do with anything? Because they always wanna piece things, right, together. They wanna make it valuable. But with language, I like to keep them in, in the dark a little bit because they'll want to go answer the questions. And I didn't tell y'all this and I forgot. I always tell my students, don't answer the questions yet. I just want y'all to read. Just read. When you're done reading, look up so I know you're read, done reading. I don't even want you to touch the questions because right now I don't care what the questions are. I don't care if you got the right answer or the wrong answer. I just want to read. Then we talk about what it was about. Sometimes, and I would suggest this to you as instructors, if you're teaching language, um, connect it. This is something Milton said, connect it to their lives. Start, man, I am, like I said, I'm a complainer. Do, is anybody in here a complainer? And then they go into, oh yeah, I'm a complainer. Or they don't think they are, right? They, they, and you're like, do people call you a complainer? Does your husband tell you you're a complainer like mine? Right? So you want to help engage them with questions. Okay. Cause we're going to get into some details here in a minute, but with that main open question, 
try to get them to go, ah, oh, this is kind of a cool reading. I think I want to show this to somebody. <laughs> They're like, I want to show this to my spouse, right? Um, but you want them to be interested in what they're reading and just having them read or let me just say this even worse reading it to them is not going to interest them so interest them and have them read it and then talk about it michelle so as far as uh i know that we talk a, a lot about this is a time test and things like that would you tell the student though to at least look at the questions prehand before you read the mm -hmm. content? Okay. Yeah, yeah, when we get to the test taking strategies, we're, you know, cause we're talking about main idea and we're gonna talk about no, no, knowing the difference between main idea and details, process of elimination, that's where we're going today. But yeah, when we do get to the questions, I want, I will tell them, on the te anytime you're taking a test, one of the best strategies, and it doesn't work for every single person, but one of the best strategies you can try is look at the question first. So you kind of go in knowing, I know what I'm looking for. So the reason I didn't do that right up front is because right now, I just want to engage them in the reading. I just want them to love reading. Like, um, I know y'all have seen this, you language instructors, on that first page of practice reading, I give you a whole slew of questions to ask, right? To engage them. Um, and that in the little end note from the instructors, um, I represent you guys. And that little end note from the instructors really is just, I just want you to love to read. Because if you can like reading, if you can think reading is useful and engaging and valuable, then you'll do it more, okay? So I just want to, so that's that. But yeah, we're definitely gonna get into process of elimination. How would you use that? We're gonna get into going back and um, making sure they know, look at the questions first, then go read. So we could, uh, the, again, I'm gonna shorten this lesson. Um, we could go in and, and I would love to hear what my students think because getting them to talk they'll remember the material more. So if I said something like, um, I don't know, what what do you do when you're stressed out? Um, do you complain? And then someone will be like, oh yeah, you know, or they have a mom who complains all the time or whatever. And so they like to tell their stories. Y'all know that. If y'all are in class with students, you know, they love to tell stories, uh, their own stories. They wanna hear yours too. You matter, but you aren't the only person that matters. They matter. So if we were in class right now, I would be asking questions about, um, what do you, gosh, what do you think about that? Isn't that crazy about the the cortisol? And did y'all know that cortisol actually, they you see all the commercials all the time. That's what gives you a belly. Yeah, that's why I wear these loose fitting clothes, right? Things like that. I mean, there's just because I'm a super stressed out person all the time. So um, flight or fight, did y'all, and then I always direct that to a test. I'm like, man, that's what happens sometimes on a test. You get stressed, you know? But the complaining is doing those same types of things. It's like you're running from a wild animal and, and so that's what your brain's doing. And it's all because you're complaining. So we talk about complaining, blah, blah, blah. I think I'll get the picture. Question. Yes. So you kind of already did it, but I. Yeah. So I'm not a language person. And so if I wanted to find. Oh, that's okay. right. Sorry. So I'm not a language person, and it's not my forte. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so if I wanted to figure out, and I'm going to use the process of elimination, and maybe mm -hmm. I understood it right or not. Um, I can come up with what I think some of the main ideas might be, mm -hmm. maybe, and then use all the following uh, paragraphs to check off. This yep. makes this this connects with my first main uh, idea. What this I connects, thought, uh -huh. and then maybe if I find one that doesn't connect, maybe scratch that and then go to the other idea, right? And then do that. Maybe, process. and that's where the whole subjective thing is because maybe it is the main idea, but a point or two don't fit under there, but as a whole it does. So yeah, so don't scratch it right away. But if you're seeing more and more, oh yeah, no, that isn't the main idea. Yeah, scratch it. So I always have my students um, put it in their own words. Because if they'll put it in their own words, it means they understand it a little better than me telling them, right? So that's why I said, give me a main idea and give me your own words. So then if I say this, then I go, okay, well, yeah, this paragraph is about the, the hippocampus. Okay, yeah, that's the bodily effects. This is about this. This fits, is about, yeah. Fits, fits, yeah, this fits, fits. And I would kind of go off and check. With your papers, this is in other classes too. I, I, I like to model on the, the what is this called? Um, projector little thing, whatever, whatever it's called. I like to model how I would mark this up, 
right? Um, if I had this nifty board, like I could just, I, I, she said the touch screen part doesn't work today, but um, I would go through and go, okay, here's where I would, because I'm visual, I might draw a little picture that makes me think, okay, this is the brain, you know, or like a fried egg, right? Something, you know, the brain on drugs type thing. Okay, I would put that there because that's what that paragraph says to me. Um, and so I would go and annotate it. Or I, or this one, I would go, okay, this one is about, um, oh, people around you mirroring um, like smoking. So that to me, that's what, you know, that's kind of the idea of this little paragraph. And so I would have annotated notes on most of the paragraphs to help me go, oh, that's what I just read. Because how many times do you have students and you go, they say, oh, I hate reading because then I get down to the bottom and I forgot what I just read. Or I say, or if they don't say that first, I say, how many of you read a whole page and then you get to the bottom and you forgot what you just read? And I promise you like 98% of them are going to raise their hands. That's how they, the annotating, that's a whole other lesson, which I hope to incorporate and give language more time next time. But yeah, annotating their little papers if they have them. They do it enough by hand, they'll be able to mentally do it later on. They have to, the GED is all on, on screen, right? But this is, a, but the annotating is a good skill for college. They're gonna have these college books, these real thick college books, and they're gonna have to read all these chapters that's how they're going to remember what they read. If they're if they're putting their own own notes, their own words, their own pictures. Oh, I was just going to make uh, oh, yeah. a note, kind of something we justified or talked about before we even got into the reading. I like this, like if you're building this lesson, this is the article you want to focus on or the reading um, because how we talked about relevance. And I feel like it's a good skill to build off of, yeah. to develop, you know, their annotating, just their overall comprehension and all that good stuff because of the relevance and then you can tie into because not everything you're going to read is going to be relevant right right? Um, right but i feel like that's a great skill you know start off with what everybody may know or could relate to for the most part uh, uh fyi complaining yeah. um, <laughs> not you melted and, no, no i no never way. complain <laughs> um and just kind of build their skills from there and then dive into i would say Maybe not the best words, the, the more boring things. Okay, that, yeah, yeah. That they may not be interested the less in. Fun. Like, you know, oh, this is the the 10,000 ways to knit, whatever. Right. <laughs> um, and that way they already have developed those skills from there. So, right. yes, they can they can apply that to maybe stuff they're not as interested in. But, oh, okay, I, because I did this with stuff that I did know, I can apply it to this I for the most that. part. So. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. So your curriculum is built, hopefully, for that Um all the articles that I handpicked for industrial, for business, for healthcare. If the student said, I'm going healthcare, it's because they might have some type of interest in health healthcare, right? So all those articles are healthcare articles. Some are more fun than others, yeah, right? Some are boring. Um, but I tried to pick ones that, that might engage them. Now, when they go and take the GD, the TSI, uh, when they're in college, they're not always going to be reading something that's super relevant. But if we have taught them that reading is kind of cool, it's kind of fun. It gives you something to talk about. It gives you, like, you just, you just, you know, rewired your brain even just a little bit by learning this, right? If they can learn that, then when it comes to the boring things, they can do it. They may not love it, but they can do it. So, um, but when you already don't know how to do it and you hate it, you're doubly out, right? Um, so yeah, that's the biggest thing. Okay, so let's skip to the questions then. Let's look at that. That's the other part of, there was three parts to this lesson on your on your syllabus or your, your um, schedule of instruction. It was pronoun the antecedents, we pretend that we did those, and then there's reading, and then there's process of elimination, or main idea, details, I think we, we know the difference. And then there was process of elimination. So, Process of elimination as, let me scroll down, sorry. That's, I knew I was walking over here for a reason. Too much Coke syrup, too much complaining. Okay. So look at this first question. The main idea of the passage can be found in which of the following sentences? Um, I don't want you to give me the answer. Students want to rush to the answer, but studies show, all the test taking studies show that if you'll, if you use process of elimination, you're more likely to come to the answer. 
um, because most tests, it doesn't matter if you're taking like PSATs, SATs, whatever, GED same, TSI same, um, they're gonna give you one pretty outlandish one that you can mark out, right? One like, that doesn't make any sense. One that maybe, but but it's it's close to outlandish, but not quite, could be a slight possibility. That third one sometimes is picked by um, students who English is not their first language. So they don't read as as well, right? They, they're more looking for key points and that third one will have a lot of key words. And so someone who didn't read that well um, might go, oh, those are key words. So there's four answers. Your, your one is outlandish. The other one will have some key terms, but it still doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then you have two that are so close that you really have to know what you're doing. So what I like to tell students, because many times they get it wrong with one of the two, I say, that's okay, that's good. You're at least down to two. You got a 50-50 chance, right? But let's start, y'all tell me, paragraph, it says the main idea of this passage can be found in which of the following sentences. So these are pulled from, from the reading. Which sentence doesn't, which sentence would you mark out first? Which one stands out to you and you go, no, nah, it can't be that. I've got this. I'm going to stand up here. Maybe this light will, there we go. That's better. I can't read that. Which would you mark out first? I'm going to say the last one. Okay. The main idea should be at the top. Okay. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes we can, yeah, find the, yeah, I guess that would be, as you're teaching main idea, many times look in that first paragraph or sometimes even the last paragraph, but first or last. But yes, okay, let's look at that then. Let me see. Since human beings are inherently social, our brains are our brains naturally and unconsciously mimic the moods of those around us, particularly people we spend a great deal of time with. So was everything, I, I would agree. Do y'all agree that, that we can mark that one out? Um, yes, it's it's not at the top. Why else could we mark that out? It has nothing to do with, we were talking some about the effect on your body and yeah. health, and it really doesn't have anything to do with that. Okay, yeah, we already, we already did this. So on the GD, when you're taking this, and this is what you're reading, you get a little whiteboard, quickly jot down a main idea, just like we did there. Okay, physical effects on the body. Complaining has physical effects on the body. You write that down on your board, and you go, wait, that doesn't go under this umbrella. No, out, right? Okay, what else? What else? Which which one would you mark out next? A. A, okay, research shows that most people complain once a minute during a typical conversation. You're probably listening wow. to my conversations. That is, that, that's a scary fact, by the way, it's scary. But yeah, that's a teensy detail. Like, you know, research shows. Usually when you see a research shows, that's a tip. It's probably not the main idea, right? It's probably a little bit data. So I'd say A and D are gone, okay. Um, now, between one and seven, complaining is tempting because it feels good. But like many other things that are enjoyable, such as smoking or eating pound cake, oh, a pound of, sorry, I'm going to cake, a pound of bacon for breakfast, complaining isn't good for you. Then we have all the extra cortisol re released by frequent complaining impairs your immune system and makes you more susceptible to high cholesterol, diabetes, heart dis disease, and obesity. So which one of those is more broad like the umbrella? Which would more things fit under? I would say C and B. Okay, I got C and B. I've got a debate here. Who all says C? Who all says B? Oh, okay. Now you have to tell me why B, why C? Because if our main idea is the physical effects of complaining, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. C goes into detail. It does. It, it, it's okay, so there are physical effects, okay. but I want to know what they are. Okay. So um, besides just giving me a headache when people annoy me, um, <laughs> What is good? What's what's it? You're telling me it's bad, so what's it going to do? Okay, so you're saying uh, this is this kind of goes with our main idea, but we're asking ourselves the main idea, right? Okay, so that does that does go along with our physical effects um, of complaining or complain. Oh no, that was a bad one. Sorry, complain. What was yours? Yours was complaining is isn't good for you. Mm -hmm. Complaining isn't isn't good for you. Um, so. All right. Why do you disagree? Um, Y'all are, here's what's good. Y'all got down to the, the two. So 
hey, at this point, 50-50 chance, right? Even if you have to just boom, guess, go. Okay. Why B? Okay. I don't think it's C because it's too specific. And I know that B, if it's not good for you, that also includes behavior. And on the second, on paragraph two, it talks about the behavior. Okay. Good. So I, B is, it can cover more. Right. And C is too specific to right. just the physical. It's it's more, This is more broad than these other ones, but it's not as broad as this one. This one's going to cover, yes, that, and what about that whole social part of it, right? The social, how complaining is bad socially. Melton. Oh, no, I was just going to say, Go and then two, you could say C could fit under the umbrella of B. It fits under um, B. Because it is a way of how it is, isn't good for you. And you oh. kind of explained that. You said it, it 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 described it. Yeah. So if it's describing or giving details, then it's a detail. But those are the two that you're going to have to struggle with. And in class, what I like for my students to do, they don't just get to give me the right answer. First of all, I would need them to give me the wrong answer. Process of elimination. It's better for them. Then two, if they call out an answer and it's right, I'm like, okay, well, who all agrees, who doesn't agree? And then you have to give me, even the people who are wrong, I want to know why. Why do you think that? So if I know you think it that way, I can fix it and say, well, I can definitely see why you think that, but this is a detail and you kind of said it yourself. So you're going to help them self-assess, self-evaluate, right? So that's how I would do that. And then, of course, we would go on to the next in the same fashion. Here's the question. Give me the one that makes the least sense. Eliminate it. Process of elim elimination. So when you're taking a test, you read so that you can answer a, a, a question, right? In life, you're not always going to be quizzed and have, have a quiz over what you just read. But for this test, you will. So what I'm going to suggest, and this is where Michelle was talking about, is when you get to your test, TSI, I don't care what you're taking, GED, anything you take, CASAs, read the question. You'll have an idea of what they're asking. Then read the question, kind of skim through. Don't like in detail read the questions, but skim through. Okay, we're going to be looking for the main passage, main, main idea of the passage. Okay, and then I'll read this one and go, um, okay, repeated complaining, making future complaining. Okay, so I would do that, and then I would go through. And so I know kind of where we're, then we're gonna look for the purpose. And then I'd go through and read. I have these things in, in, in mind. I need to know my main idea, because I wrote that down. I also need to know um, how does repeated complaining affect future complaining, and then um, what's the author's purpose. So I've written that down on my board. I'm in the GED test, it's times going, going. And I just wrote those quick things down when I read these are the things I'm looking for. So in real life, when you're reading a Peanuts magazine, you're reading for fun, it's because reading is fun. Um, but here, we need some tips, and here's the two biggest tips. Read your question first, and then do process of elimination. Don't ask yourself what the answer is, ask yourself what the answer isn't. Mark it out really quick and move on. So it's less clutter, you don't have to think about that one anymore, you know that it didn't make sense, and then move on. So. So that was a very quickly condensed version of how I would teach a language class. I, we didn't do the pronoun agreement thing, but the reading is the most important. So when we come back again for the next PD um, like this, the next reading, it will be, we'll have more reading. I'm gonna dedicate my time to language. Uh, we'll have more reading on the higher order thinking skills like huh, the analyzing the summarizing, the drawing conclusions, the making generalizations. Those are, those are the top four in, uh, that we're lacking in reading. But I think that's the top four if you're a language teacher, you know, everybody's lacking those higher order thinking skills. So we're gonna d dive into that and decide like how, and how do we do that? How do we present that? How do we get them to analyze, draw conclusions, make generalizations? Those, those are gonna take a little more, so yeah, anything? You want to add to that, take away from that? Okay. All right then. So that will conclude that part of the lesson and we'll just make a quick two minute turnaround and we'll do the um, next math lesson. And we won't even get through the entire thing, but I'll kind of show you the buildup of it and rush through it. And there you go. All right. All right. 
this is the last piece and, and it really is a super condensed piece. Um, Michelle wanted me to put this one in. I, it, I was going to anyway, but she wanted me to put this in even with our crunch time. Um, because if you're a math teacher, you know, um, and you've seen this math GD and you've seen the CASAs, you know that this is a huge piece. So I'll try to leave out as much fluff as possible um, and give you the lesson. Again, I'm gonna start with trying to be engaging, okay? I want to make sure I'm not the only one talking. You need a heading, you have yours up there. Um, expressions. And you will find, you guys, the more you have your students take notes, they get into this groove where they go, what's my, what's, what's the heading today? And like they, they just kind of, they know where you're going to go. They know what you're going to do. And then they start expecting a certain flow. And never again, everybody teaches differently. So they'll start to expect your flow. So if I don't put a heading, I, I will always have a student say, what's this heading again? I'm like, oh, oh, we're doing expressions. Okay. So expressions at math teachers are such a large part of equations inequalities, just plain old expressions, um, they have to know how to build these. So we're gonna start again, super basic, okay? What do you know about, you have, you have some boxes here and they kind of look like this um, and then they're like this, right? So this is what this looks like. In this first box, I want you to put this, second box, third box, and fourth box. Uh, one, two, three, four. One more. That's right. I started adding this one. Okay. So, what is this? Give me some words for it. I just need words. Add. Mm hmm. Good. Add. Combine. Combine. Plus. Plus. Any more? Any more? Throw that up there. More than. And. Uh huh. And. Okay. Yeah, 15 girls and 13 boys, right? Um, what else? Starts, we don't use it often, but it starts with an S. Anybody? Some. Yeah, some. Okay. And if you come up, you know, you let your students kind of go through, fill in the gaps. Um, and a, something will spark your um, brain here and you'll go, oh yeah, I forgot this one, right? And you'll come back. Positive. Yeah, po positive, all right, I like that. All right, see, I know, see? And then you can always come back. Okay, so, and if you're doing PowerPoint or Jamboard, or whatever, you, you've got these and they could pop up, right? Um, as they say them, that's kind of cool. All right, so what about, that's how little I know about Jamboard. Maybe it doesn't even work that way, I have no clue. Um, so what What about this, what about this, right? Um, what What, terms, what words are we going to use for this symbol? Difference. Difference, okay. What else? Minus. Minus. Mm -hmm. Subtract. Subtract. What else? Take away. Take away, uh-huh. There's another one I'm searching for, and it always trips students up, so I like to make sure I use it. Negative. Negative. Ah, there it is. Ne yes, negative. And then decreased by, or less than. So what I want you to do in your notes is star these two. Um, less than, decreased by, no. Yeah, maybe, yes, less than for sure. You're less than or fewer than. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix that and I'm gonna do this one. Fewer than, less than. Okay, sorry. And then we would go through these, right? Multiplication and they would just throw them out. You're engaging them. So again, I'm not going to, I'm going to, this is an abbreviated lesson. So we would go through this. We would go through division. Um, the thing I'll, I'll, I'll bring up is one on this one because I think we know multiplication times uh, twice. I always make sure to bring up twice, twice a number. 
because that has a real specific meaning. It means times two, things like that. Um, I would bring up product because they're not used to this. The product of, so if they don't know product, they don't know expressions, right? So, so I always bring up the ones that product, sum, those are the math terms, the real math terms, right? These are what we, we like to see. Twice a number, um, multiply, we, we would go through that. I'm doing, Michelle, I'm doing an abbreviated lesson here of the, of the, yeah, of expressions. And then again, again with this, the ones I wanna make sure is quotient, make sure they know that one. Um, make sure they know half. That would mean it's a very specific type of division. It's, it's divided by two. Half a number. We don't know the number, but we know it's half a, half a number, right? So you'll see where this is all going. Again, at this time, I'm just engaging them and giving me some of their prior knowledge uh, so they can go, you know what? I kind of do know some of this. <laughs> all right. And it helps them feel a little better, and that's good. Um, you want to know what they know. And then this is going to be, they'll go equals, right? Right, equals. Anybody know what else we want here? Is. Is. That's important. Equals. Is. I think that's all I've ever come up with. It's equals and is. Very important. In all kinds of expressions. You got to know that is. So we would build that board for them. They have a reference now. They've, they've taken notes. They've made a little graphic organizer. Or you've even made it for them. You got them that empty notes. Did you get that, Milton? I'm sorry. You, I know you came in later. Did you get the little notes thing, guided notes thing? Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, so like, again, I just give them that blank piece and they're filling in as we go. Okay, we're engaging them. Okay, so this, they have they come now with some knowledge. Oh, I started these for a reason, didn't I? Let's talk about these. If I, I'll go here, move from the lesser to the greater. Um, if I say, if the phrase is the expression is 10 more than a number, 10 more than a number, what does that look like if we're putting it in math, ling in math sentences? X plus, X plus 10. You're saying you have a number. I don't know what that number is. X. <laughs> in any, you could use, I don't care, you use a box, right? A heart, a star. All it means is it represents something. So, and then we have 10 more than that. So 10 more than some number. Okay. Could I have done it this way? Yeah, but you don't want to get into the habit if you're then going to do fewer than. Good. Yeah. So yes, I can say x plus 10 and 10 plus x because we know it doesn't matter the order. But what's, what we do have to watch is so we start these, highlighted them, whatever you want to do. We want to watch this because if I say this, 10 less than a number, what are we saying here? I, I always tell my students, um, go backwards. And so if, if I said 10 less than a number, when you write it, you start with the number, less than, and then uh, 10. Some number, right? So 10 less than some number. Yeah. But uh, you know how you wrote it, 10 less than a number? If you put your finger at the, on the word number, you start there. So you, you start with number, and and then work your way backwards, less than, that's your sign, right. and then 10. So I always tell my, yeah, I tell my students, go switch their places. Yes. So on these two only, that's why I need you to star these, highlight these, whatever, these two only. Because if I said, <laughs> 10 minus a number, what does that look like? Go. Yeah, it is 10 minus some number. some number. These these are just going to follow how you read them. These two, you're going to go whoop, swap those spots. Read backwards, whatever, however you want to teach that. Just make sure that they have now mentally said, if I ever come across a less than or a fewer than, which I promise the majority of them, if it's going to subtract, it's that. It 
why? I don't know. All of them, TSI, GED, they all do that. They love less than and fewer than because and um, because they're always expecting students to get it backwards. And on the A, B, C, D, on your multiple choice, it always seems like they have it in both ways and our students go, oh, but it said, it said 10 less than a number and it's 10 minus X. And you're like, no, no, 10 less than a number, okay? So however you get them to memorize that, but that's, I just, again, I'm visual. I say it less than this way, 10 less than. Milton, what do you do? Oh, well, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're good. It. I was just wanting to say, just kind of speaking about, you know, how we're, deciphering between the two why you have to be consistent it's also important like when you get into the later um later concepts like inequalities to kind of keep yeah. a certain order because students i notice want to flip and switch and do all that which they really can't right but you know we have to address it like something as small as this like well you technically could but it's better to stay consistent here right because it leads to there and then further down the line, they're like, okay, ha there's a reason why there's an order. I agree, I agree. If you see more than or, and so you could go with that, anything that's like than, more than, less than, fewer than, just go ahead and start making sure you're doing that backwards. Yeah, because you're right, we're gonna, and that's the whole thing. Are you gonna use this on the test? Yes, and now are they gonna make you put this chart out and they're gonna ask you how, what's multiplication words? No, but you're gonna use this and let's use it. All right, so here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you, oops, I erased my title. I'm gonna ask you not to shut down, okay? This is really what I would ask my students. Don't shut down on me. What we're about to do, it's a little mind twisting and is my students' least favorite thing to do in all of mathematics. You thought it was fractions. You would be wrong. Word it's, <laughs> it's word problems. And not just word problems, but like expression word problems where numbers are missing. And you, on some of them, you can't really check your answer. You just have to know your answer. So expression. So I say, always tell my students where we're going here. I just don't want you to shut down on me. If you need to take like a quick mental break, like I can't see this anywhere. Open your eyes and come back to me, okay? Don't shut down. We're gonna work through. And if at first it's a little mind twisting, um, the more you do it, it's not difficult, it's just different. And the more we do things that are different, they become more similar and then they're easy, right? Okay, that's not my quote, that's somebody else's quote, but I love it, okay. So based on what we just did, we got some terms down, you have them in there. Um, if I needed a number sentence for this, and this is, by the way, directly, something like, the, well, this is probably an easy one. Um, they're, these are directly on the test, then. Twice a number, you have it on your paper. So I may not write all these because they can get long, okay? So you, I have them already pre-prepared and that's how I would give them to the students. So eight less than twice a number. What does that look like? Let's build it. What does that look like in a mathematical phrase? A number sentence. I see the less than, so I remember now that you said to do it backwards. Okay, so I'm gonna mark this guy up. It's like reading, right? I told you there's some reading involved. This is minus, we kind of, we know that, and you said the backwards thing, right, so. so. Yeah, so it's gonna be backwards. That's me and my visual. Okay, so we know, we know there's a minus somewhere. And then twice means what? It means times two, and again, we didn't really build that, but y'all would in class. Twice, twice a number, okay. A number is X. Yeah, because we don't know it. We can call it N, X, P, heart, I don't care. So twice some number. So what does twice a number look like? Two N? Yeah, two N, twice a number, two X, whatever. Okay, so then we have, we gotta come back here. Eight less than twice a number. Does it look like this? Or does it look like this? The second, the second one, because it's supposed to be back. So, eight less than twice a number. If there was an A, B, C, D, those two would be on there. And they would have other things as options. And we, we have those on, I have some examples as we move on to harder ones. Yeah, if they have an A, B, C, D, I promise, these are up there. And these are what our students are gonna struggle with. They'll go, wait, but it's less than we said, subtract, yeah, but 
less than, remember? So there's that. Look at that next one. We won't do all these because we're like, oh, I want to hit a really hard um, word problem uh, or a couple, one hard word problem and one hard geometry problem that you would see. So I'll let, we'll do one more teensy easy one. Easy one. <laughs> I know, Michelle, when we did it, went over this, she's like, those are easy. It's like, yeah, those are easy. So look at the third one, the quotient of the sum of four and two times the number and the difference of six less than three times the same number. Oh my goodness. Don't read it like that. Break it down. So I want you to, I want, I want you to struggle with that one. And I say struggle because that means struggle. And you may get it wrong. That's good. I want to know your thinking. We're going to build it. So that third one, I should have put it on the screen. Didn't have enough for thought. It's this third one. It's beauty. The quotient of the sum. The quotient of, okay, let's start with the quotient of. I do, I better not, I'll, I'll break something. What's quotient? Division. Division, okay. The quotient of what? The sum. Okay, the sum of what? Okay, so the sum of four and two times the number, all right? So if I was to write on, I do, I want, I'm just gonna. Sure, I'm gonna break something. It won't let me. So if I was gonna do that, I was go, I'd go, okay, division. And what am I dividing? I'm dividing, okay, well, here's the first part. The sum of, sum means plus four and two times the number. So what does that look? Just stop there at that, co that comma. What does that look like? The sum, the quotient of the sum of four and two times the number. What does that look like? It'd be four plus two x. Okay, so four plus two x, and we know division's going on somewhere, right? Yeah. So okay, so we we'll, you the we numerator, can, huh? Yeah, we can hang on to this for a second because we know that that we're going to be dividing something, but it's the quotient of this, and let's go find out of what else. Like, what are we going to divide? What are we going to divide? And in our terminology, we would have gone over the um, order of division, always as you read it. Okay, so here's the quotient of this. I would mark that up, the quotient of this. And the difference of six less than three times the number. Lovely. So I said, don't shut down. What does that look like? And the... Three X minus six. Okay. And the difference of six less than three times the number. So the quotient of, quotient, division bar, of the sum of four times, plus two times, or the sum of four and two times a number, divided by, or this is the other part of the quotient, six less than three times the number, do you see it? So on your A, B, C, D, you're gonna have all these same numbers somewhere in some form. And so if you'll swift swap with me, this is correct, by the way, beautiful, I love it. Okay, so if you'll switch to the next page, what I'll show you. So then there's, there's other ones. I wanna just call your attention to this bottom one. Same thing's going on here. The only difference. What do y'all, what is the difference? There's a, uh, yes. So here, we can't find x, and this is what you would do, go in do in class with your expressions. You guys, I can't, you, we're not gonna find x, right? Here we're not. Why are we not? Because we don't have anything to balance it with. There's no equals. So by then, you've already talked about the prop properties of, yeah, right, balancing. This is just an expression. Okay, this one is an equation, difference. And so you'd go, okay, is, there's, there's that is, super important, okay? So there's that. All right, so this next, I do want you to go to the next page because this is just building that skill of how they can build an expression 
they are seldom asked to build an expression on the test, but what we, we're trying to build their skill. If they can build an expression, they can find an expression a lot better. We can sw jump right to help, how to help them find this expression, which one, A, B, C, or D. I marked them out because they were already answered. One, A, B, C, or D. We can teach them some tips on how to do that, but if we teach them how to build one, they'll much easier find one. So yeah, it's a little more work. But that's what we do. Okay, so this next one here, then I'll let y'all do this. Um, I'll just give y'all a quick few minutes and look at this first one and tell me which one you think it is. The first, second, third, or fourth, A, B, C, or D. I'll try to s zoom. And then we're gonna do a word problem, I think. Oh, I think I... I'm not sure why I brought the two. I'm sorry, there was a... These are the same, repeat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I just forgot to delete it. But there is a difference if you look at how the way we did it compared to the, how the answer choices... Right. Right. Yeah, we didn't. Um, we wrote it the way it said it. First, we say just kind of put it in that order that Right, right. So, but if you can build it, you know what you're looking for, right? So, which one did y'all pick? A, B, C, or D? A. A? Anybody disagree? Okay. So, why, why did you not pick these? There you go. Okay, good. They're multiplying. So these two are the division. Remember, there's always like two you can throw out, right? These two, so close. And what did they do? Which one is the one they're trying to trip you up on? The less than. It's that whole less than. They love that. Whoever, you know, I think test makers are sadistic. So that's all there is to it. They're crazy. They just like you to be miserable. Just kidding. And the only reason why I call it out is because I have some students yeah, but yeah. Yeah, and so I like to comfort them and say, the good thing is you, you aren't likely going to be asked to ever create that yourself, but you can pick it out of a lineup. You can go this way. Yeah, so you're right, because they'll go, but we did it this way. Right, right, right. But you have the concept down. So the last thing I'll do, very last thing, is this word problem, and we'll shut her down. Um, cause everybody needs to eat and I didn't bring donuts. So let's look at this beauty. This is, okay, so down, uh, 27, this is a S here, sorry, 6S, kind of faded out. Um, this, that, those questions are actually pulled from the study guides on GED.com. I'm not come up with them. And this is also, this is from one of the free practice tests you can take for GED.com. This is what we're looking at. So did we need, so when they say, is this gonna be on the test? Do I need to know some? Guess what? Yes, because <laughs> here we go. Um, do I need to know more than, do I need to know twice? Do I need, to, yes, you do. They're like me and piano. I just wanted to learn the piano. I didn't want to play the key after key after key after key. Like, just give me the whole piece and teach me how to play that. Well, it doesn't work that way. You got to start with like, you know, the one, the one, the one. You're hitting that same note over and over and over. So yeah, it's going to be on the test. Okay, so let's look at this beauty and we'll break it down. I'm going to actually come over here and write on it. What I like to do is in class, I will project if I have a, a thing like this or I use a book of some kind, I project it and bring my, my screen, like, you know, I put my screen up, you know? So I project it onto the whiteboard because in most classes, your projector's a, over a whiteboard. And so I just write, I project this and that way I can just do it on the whiteboard. It, it just makes it a little easier, but I'll do it here on the dock. I don't like to face away from my students. I'm weird about the dock cam, so I'll try to, Stay here and we know we're on the same area. Okay. So there are steps from the pedestal to the head of the Statue of Liberty. 
visual. I'm at the pedestal and there's the head of the Statue of Liberty. Long, huge, big. Okay, got it. The number of steps in the Washington Monument. So I'm going to just write some stuff here. You got the statue. Um, and then we switch in the sentence, uh, in the paragraph. The number of steps in the Washington Monument, so now we're talking about Washington Monument, is 27 less than six times the number. Okay, I tell my students, don't keep reading. It's already a lot of words. Let's start breaking it down right here, okay? So, the number of steps in the Washington Monument, here's my Washington Monument, <clears throat> is, what is is? Is, okay, good. So the Washington Monument is something. Let's find out what that something is. Is 27 less than six times the number. So what is 27 less than six times the number? And we'll finish that out in just a second. But what's 27 less than look like? Yeah, 27 less than something. Less than what? Now here we are. Six times the number of steps in the Statue of Liberty. Do we know how much is in the Statue of Liberty? Look, over, look at it again. Huh? No. Do y'all see anything for the Statue of Liberty? No. no. We don't know. We just know it's a long way, okay? So we'll just say that it looks like they're using S. So we'll say, okay, the Statue of Liberty is something, some number. We don't know. But we do know that the Washington Monument is 27 less than whatever, or six times whatever the statue is, right? So we know that, we don't know the statue, but we do know that the Washington Monument is 27 less than six times the statue right? So you're just breaking these apart. And so what I tell my students, and you may teach this differently, but for our students, and Milton, I know you could, you could speak to that, Diana, too. Um, for our students, when they see all this information, and they're reading it like that, it's already mind-twisting, right? Because there's missing stuff. And I say, just stop. Take one piece of information and make some notes. What's this? I got a statue. Okay, got the statue. How much is the statue? I don't know. I don't see it. It doesn't tell me. It just says there are steps. That's all I know. Steps. And I could even write. Statue has some steps. So connecting some reading, some writing, some math, all at the same time, um, just have them break it apart. And then you go, okay, I see it. I see what I wrote. But before I do that, I want to rule out something else. I want to go, okay, well, why is it not this? And so that's where you're going to question your students. Why not this? Why not this? And you're going to have to get them to t tell you why is it not the other pieces? So why is it not this? What is this one saying? If we're talking math term terminologies, expressions, well, in a non in a non math termy way, okay. because I'm not a math person, Good. I'm just like when I read that, I know that six times the number has to go together. Good. And so that six S has to be together, and I know those parentheses are interrupting it, and so something's wrong there. I love that. This is a not. This is a language teacher. See, uh, there you go. You, yeah, you. We already said six times the number is six S. So whatever we do, better have a six S in there. So process of elimination that cannot make any sense. That's the first one I'd mark out. Well, I'm looking for a six S. That has six S. That has six S. Okay, and then um, fine. What about then? Why why is it not one of these? Anybody? Also, as non-language, I will say the you know the little Pac-Man signs. I can't remember which way, but one of them's less than, <laughs> one of them's greater than. Sure. It didn't. It does say less than. Uh huh. And my logic's falling apart. That's but okay. Anyway, but something. Less than a number, I, I'm pretty sure it's minus and not like the less than yeah. greater than thing. How would you, how do you explain that? I know you want to say that, say yeah. something. Oh, he has a, he has a mic. Well, we already defined that we have is in there. So we have already our, our equality symbol, the equal symbol in there. So right. we shouldn't have an inequality symbol whatsoever. Right. Washington Monument is something, not 
this because these these inequalities and if you wanted to throw that in your math terms like and mm -hmm. put another column for these you could do that so mm -hmm. they could start going oh, okay mm -hmm. this is not the same as this less yeah. than this yeah. less than is not this less We're than saying what it is already right what it could be or what it is yeah, so as soon as you you see the word right. is you already know that your little alligators are not going to be part of it gone that's a good way that's a good way if you see it is we're talking equals. We're not talking this or this. So less than has to be less than. That's beautiful. Language note Please do. And I also want to note, because I don't know how many people heard it, and it, it, was, it for sure wasn't on the video before you do that, um, because you said this earlier. So she talked about having these guided notes already filled in for maybe those students who struggle um, uh, we want to challenge them to take notes, right? But those who really struggle to write or really struggle to take the notes and are, are you, you know they're getting lost, um, if you have your notes already filled in, they many times can highlight and then just bring in little annotations or, or bring in extra practice. Um, now, I wouldn't, I don't know that I'd suggest doing that for everybody because I think some people will take that easy road out. But I think that in language, same thing. Sometimes in language, you want like this like the one we're doing, you want them, some things already printed already out, right? You don't want to have to sit there and write that or have them write it. But yes, so having those already filled out and prepped to give a student who, who you know, they're not going to be able to follow along with the notes. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Go ahead. So when I teach um, the students to approach a language passage, um, the first things that we do uh, as we develop over time is you, you highlight the titles and you trying to teach them to skim read a little right. bit you teach i've teach them to go through and you look for names dates right and numbers okay um a lot of times you're looking for proper nouns yeah so yeah. you could do that also in a lot of your word problems you can do exactly the same thing is. because what you have yes. right here is the statue of liberty and the washington monument those are your big capitalized proper nouns. Right, that's good. And so, you know, when you're reading a long passage and you're like, well, who said this? What are we? Sure. Where are we? What are we talking about? Those like proper idea. nouns can be huge. And it, it holds true for a lot of your word problems, sure. too. Even going back to, you know, like Jan had five apples and Joe had 15. Or you got to keep it straight who Jan and Joe are. Or and James how many each one of them charges $20 to come out to your house and uh, diagnose a plumbing issue. And then he charges $25 per hour for labor. So already you got James, you've got... 25 is your base, right? And you, or 20, uh, 50 is your base and then 25 per hour, right? So you you have, you've pulled out your numbers, mm -hmm. you've pulled out your proper your proper nouns, who's doing what and how can I make this relevant, right? Yeah, yeah. cool, I like that. Didn't think about that, yeah, statue, Washington Monument. These should have been capitalized, my friends, I'm sorry. Sorry to you language teachers, Statue of Liberty. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, 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 I'm sorry we had to like rush through that, um, but I hope that gives you some idea. You do have lots of um, examples there. On the back, there's even geometry type examples um, in your notes. So how would this apply to geometric figures um, with expressions? Um, but again, this is one of those core thing, one of those five core things that they need to know, and it will apply across so many different uh, little disciplines. So like, it'll be expressions, but it'll have fractions in it. It'll be expressions, but it'll be about ratios, but they're all expressions. It'll be about average, but they're still expressions. And Melton, yeah, I know you know what I'm talking about. And so it's like, there's so many pieces that have to come together to get this far, and this is taught in math too, so. I just wanna thank y'all for coming. <laughs> it's been great, and um, thank y'all for engaging. Um, I hope it was valuable, relevant. I hope you could see that. But for our students, that's it. If you will make it engaging and, and again, you don't have to be the, ah, oh, right. But you, but make, make them a part of it. It's not like, you're not the end all be all. They have, they have knowledge, pull it out of them. I, that's what I would start out with. So if I'd let you take away some main points of putting together a lesson plan, it's going to be this. Engage them with the knowledge they already know, right? Don't just assume they know nothing. They know something. 
So engage them with the knowledge they already know. Make sure you're doing 10 and 2. 10 and 2, not exact. 10 minutes lesson, 2 minutes practice. So I, I model, I teach, you do. So I do, we do, you do. So that's what we want. That way, remember that whole, um, that science of forgetting, the more they're practicing it, the more they're reviewing it, the more it's gonna stick further back in the memory bank. So engage them with what they know, make sure you got your 10 and two, and then at the end say, okay. So if I say X, Y, Z, what do I mean by, right? So if you're in language, when I say main idea, what, do you, what am I saying when I say main idea? Okay, um, so you'll, you'll pull back a question from that day. What is the pronoun? What is it? Okay, so if this sentence is this, what's the pronoun and antecedent? So you're just gonna pull that all the way back. Same thing with the math, okay? Find something in there to know that, to, to make them think, oh, this is what I learned today. Because sometimes they'll walk out and they go, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I learned today. <laughs> My brain's fried. But make them remember what, so you can make them write it down. There's great, lots of good science with, if they write it, like give, okay, three things we learned today, two things that are unclear and one thing that's really clear. You could do that right before they leave. So just to keep their brains coming back to and they're expected to be a part and engage them. That's all I got. Thank y'all for so much for coming. The tools and resources that we we looked at and practiced today can be used by seasoned teachers and by new teachers alike. And sometimes us seasoned teachers need to look at, at our lessons and, and see how we can make them more effective. Maybe they've been effective, but how can we make them more effective? So what I hope that all teachers of all levels can take from this is what can I do again and what can I do to engage them so that I can help transform their lives, that's our job. At the end of the day, the two things that make effective lessons are making them engaging and making sure they're valuable to our students. So I know you can do this.